off-prem as being 114 million or 15% of our overall business. And you'll see the accessories are only about 4% of our business, I mean 0.4% of our business. And the next slide is uh, shows the breakdown of spirits and wine by those category types. So if you look at the first pie chart on the top, you'll see spirit sales broken down that retail is 410 million or 90% of it, where the on-premise is 9% and off-premise is 1%. And the same in the, you can see the wine breakdown where retail is 56% or 172 million on-premise is 7% or 20 million, and off-premise is 37% or the 112 million. So the next slide that we have, I will turn over back to the chairman. Thank you, Tina. So on page 17, members of the committee, is marketing, merchandising, and warehousing. That is run by our director, Lori Piper. She's been with us just a little over a year. It's come to us from uh, the private sector and has done a great job. You can see what falls under her purview. On page 18, you can see the outlets that we have, um, just in a breakdown by a map. And at the bottom, you'll notice 10 stores that are providing curbside or in-store pickup, and that will be expanded and on in further review by Deputy Commissioner Broussard Jordan when we get to that section. FY 2020, these are our top 15 locations in the state, the top 15 stores. You can see the total down the bottom on the right that they do, about 305, a little over 305 million. On page 19, you'll see the FY 2020, these are the state owned outlets that we have. They represent a, a little over 159 million or 26% of our total sales. Uh, you'll see the agency stores on page 21. At one time, there was a need for these types of stores and the commission had concentrated on expanding into areas where they weren't. Uh, there's no longer a need with the additional square footage that we have and the new stores that were in place but these in three individual stores are licensed uh, and re-licensed on a yearly basis. On page 22, you'll see our new Portsmouth location. And on the right-hand side of the page, you'll see the sales increase of 14.1% since we've opened that in October of 18. Again, in Lancaster, opened in October of 18, you can see the sales increase of 47.2%. On page 24, you'll see the Tri-City location. This was a consolidation of our Dover and our Summersworth store. And just note that this is the old Dover trolley station that was rehabilitated and, uh, and renovated to be one of our outlets. And you can see the increase of 19.9% since we've moved to that location. Our new outlet in Tilton opened in May of 2020. That was a consolidation of two stores. And you can see the increase of 16% in that location since we opened it. On page 25 is our uh, West Lebanon location that was opened in September of 2019 and the sales increase of 22.4% since that new outlet has been opened. And you can see on page 27, our upcoming outlets and the, and the dates that they'll be open in Epsom, Gorham, Littleton, Concord, and Manchester. And there is a new one being built in New London as well. And at this time, I'd like to introduce uh, Deputy Commissioner Brassard Jordan to take you through the new initiatives that the commission is undertaking. Yeah, can you just, uh, we can pause for a second. Representative Herbert has another question. Sure. Just for history, uh, my advertising agency under John Sununu um, ran the Liquor Commission advertising for four years. So I have an interest and a background in it. I was, my question was, do you do takeout? We do in-store pickup and we do curbside delivery in 10 locations at this point, and we'll be expanding that uh, 
come the end of the month of January. So it's been a positive thing. It absolutely has. And that's part of the deputy commissioner's presentation representative. Yes. My, Thank my, you. Only problem, my only problem is that we need more locations. Okay, uh, Representative Terry has his hand up. <clears throat> Oh, thank and you, Mr. We, will, we will have more upcoming. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, Representative Terry. Not sure to whom this question should be directed. Um, however, if we were to return to an earlier point in the presentation, would, would you kindly state or restate uh, the rationale for uh, presenting the mass data? Uh, how was that integral to your presentation? I, I really missed that. And the second question is, why can't I buy Ling Ling in New Hampshire? <laughs> that's beer. And we'll talk about uh, beer. All right. That's a separate subject. All right. Uh, so the and in Massachusetts, is he, um, it, it's been in somewhat of an ongoing issue for us to be conscious of, of right now of total wines. Um, that because they're a publicly traded corporation and their, their mission in life is to, uh, um, you know, is be the, the number one source of selling liquor all over the place. So they have changed, you know, they're, they're, they have somewhat affected our business model because now we have to be conscious of where they are, where they're located. Um, in general, Massachusetts is issue of ongoing in Massachusetts has been the Massachusetts prior, you know, really limited uh, to, to um, having their grocery stores uh, in the business of selling, um, of selling the wine and liquor. They've now changed that, you know, and now really upscaling it. So it, it definitely has an impact for our stores along the along the uh, along the border. So, so primarily it's fiscal. It's revenue. A, yeah. So. Got it. Thank you. All right, so we got other hands. Okay, Representative Burroughs, you're next. Yeah, just to, I, I don't want to make this a, a long discussion. I was just very curious. I know that this goes back to 1935. Curious to know what was the rationale for the state overseeing liquor in an industry, you know, an industry in other states that are run by entrepreneurs. I'm just curious about that. I assume it might have been tied to prohibition. Uh, it was absolutely uh, the repeal of the prohibition. Uh, if you read the uh, 21st Amendment, it, it, um, it, it basically said a state could stay dry if it wanted to, if the state wanted to be dry. Um, and then at that time, uh, the issue was how do, we, uh, how do we bring liquor back? How do we get back? Um, and so each state could choose there's model. And like I say, there's it basically uh, the, the main two models that came out of it was a, a free for all or a controlled state model. And, and which we're one of those controlled state models. And of course, um, we're the most successful controlled state model. Uh, but um, other states have struggled with it and have and become somewhat hybrids about it. But uh, at the end of the day, that was the decision at the time to how we have uh, allow uh, liquor to be available with uh, with a minimum amount of, of, of problems that have, that forced the prohibition in the first place. Thank you very much. Yeah, Representative Gleason. Gleason. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my question goes back to slide ten uh, on that chart that shows the net profits going back to the 1930s. What happened in the late 1990s to cause the net profits to more than double in the next 10, to so, 10 or so years? Uh, I, I can let the commission do it, but I believe that's when we opened up wine sales and grocery wines. stores. It was wines and grocery stores, but is that, okay. is that correct? Yeah. See, I got that one right. <laughs> Okay, you all said, you know, just put your, your hand down, Jeff, that'd be great. Uh, Representative Bartlett. Thank you. Um, I was just hoping that we'll get a copy of this PowerPoint. Yes, absolutely. This will great, be there's no way I'm going to take notes on all of this. <laughs> no. <laughs> Thank you. I, I actually kind of think it's good to see it, and then you can go back and look for it when you look for the information, but just to follow along with it, this is a nice way to do it. Okay, uh, Jane, you're up next. Representative Bode. Uh, uh, thank you. I have a couple questions. I'm muted. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Christy, just take your hand down, please. Yep. Okay, go ahead. Uh, all set? Yes, go ahead. Okay. Uh, the new Manchester location, could you tell me where that is going to be located? It will be on Gold Street in Manchester. It's uh, it'll be across the street from the Walmart, just a little bit up the street from the Walmart. 
And uh, another question, are all of the um, liquor stores on leased property or do the, does the state own some of the property, properties nope. where the liquor stores are? No, nope, we all, I have the slide up. Okay. There's, yes. a, there's a slide up in front of you now that Tina put up that shows our state owned locations. And uh, just one last uh, question. Is there a uh, somewhere I, where I can locate the property owners, a list of the property owners? Absolutely, all of our leases are uh, available for anyone to view. So we Thank can you. Look at, we can look at every single property owner and the terms of every single lease. And I can just gather that information on the web, on the website. Yes, yeah. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay, got no more hands, so you may proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and committee members. So I'll take you through the marketing um, initiatives that we have done. First on slide 28 is a new website that we launched in September of 2020 with improved nav navigation, search function, and product information displays. Secondly, we inserted curbside pickup as well as uh, in-store pickup um, hey, Bill. Chris, Chris, could you? Yeah, all right, thank you. Okay, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was trying to figure out excuse where the noise was coming. Excuse me, Mr. Chairman. Can I um, interrupt just for a sec? Yeah. I'm going to leave the meeting. Um, and Christina Dyer from my office is now hosting the meeting. Just wanted to, you to know why I'm disappearing. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, sorry. No problem. Take I care. Knew, I knew it was coming. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, yes, go, go ahead, I'm sorry for the interruption. Thank you. Um, so the new website launch that we did supported in-store pickup and curbside shopping, but also allowed us to have the pay online function, which was, was much needed. Um, so on the right-hand part of the slide, you'll see the curbside and in-store pickup stores that we launched. Uh, we launched two stores in May of 2020, and we currently have 10 locations and just under $1.5 million has been purchased through uh, that curbside and in-store pickup function. So on the bottom left-hand corner, we are on schedule to go live with our next-gen system in the fall of 2021. Um, that is our e-commerce second phase of this, which would be our business-to-business -business website, as well as our D365 implementation um, with Blue Horseshoe. That is our backend system as well as our POS system in our stores. Move on to slide 29. This is just a sampling of our in-store monthly sale flyers and displays. Um, you can see we have very eye appealing presentation in our displays in the bottom of the page. And our monthly sale flyer, which was known in the past to be celebrated in Hampshire has now been uh, reformatted and the price list went online and our new uh, in-store flyer is called Voila. And you can see examples of that there. Move on to page 30. We have monthly sales, which I'm sure you're all aware of. And here is highlighted uh, a number of assets that we have. And through email, digital advertising, in-store posters, social media posts, and placement on our new website. Move on to uh, page 31. This is a brand building campaign we did for New Hampshire producers in August of 2020, where we enhanced the discount, put up displays for New Hampshire wineries and distilleries. You can see that there was a lot of social media banner ads, and we did a number of Facebook Live events, which consumers uh, participated in and were very excited about. We also changed the New Hampshire made uh, branding presentation. You'll see where it says New Hampshire made 10% off. We dropped the number of bottles that you needed to purchase down to three from six and consumers can purchase three bottles of New Hampshire made products and receive 10% off. It was, a, it was a great program and uh, really liked by all. Move on to page 32. This is just an example of some of the social media and email marketing. We did some rebranding of our emails and you can see that we have over 200,000 recipients of our emails every single month. So Instagram actually doubled um, 
the number of followers in 2020. So very exciting stuff. Move on to page 33, our digital campaign activations that we did. Obviously we had to pivot from in-person events to online to, to address the pandemic. Our first was our summer fun program, which is usually events that we hold throughout the state, turned into a scavenger hunt where consumers could go and uh, be part of the scavenger hunt, find the scavenger hunt items and play along to win some of our, our prizes. Then we had to change our distiller showcase and winter wine spectacular, which were large uh, events for our consumers. We now change that to 90 days around the world. It's still going on and ends January 30th. We have had a lot of players on that, a lot of people participating in live events with our uh, business partners throughout the United States, wine and spirits, uh, people that are on the events, sorry. <laughs> Um, and then I'll move on to our favorite things, which is a holiday guide that was put together and distributed through our stores and also downloaded on our website, which was downloaded over 960 times. And we move on to page 34. Um, we're supporting our community. We raised $604,000 in 2020, benefiting Easter Seals, New Hampshire Restaurant Relief Fund, and Animal Rescue League, as well as the Animal Shelter in Manchester and Live and Let Live Farm, as well as Best Buddies. And we currently have a raffle up um, participating for Easter Seals and the New Hampshire Food Bank to replace the events that, we, that I just mentioned. And if we move on to page 35, you can see since 2015, we've nearly raised $3 million for these nonprofits listed. Great. And um, we monitor our, our reputation. We have Google alerts that come to us every week. So we get to see what our consumers are talking about. This is a, a yearly roundup of those. It was uh, 2,405 reviews and 92% of those are four and five star ratings. So thank you for your time. And I'm gonna turn it over to Chief Mark Armaganian. Thank you, Deputy Commissioner. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and, and committee members. It's great to see everybody uh, healthy and well. Um, if we can go to page 38. Of course, this is our uh, mission statement, which as everybody knows, and I see a lot of familiar face, faces, it has a primary focus on uh, education and community safety. On Page 39, uh, we have our three-prong approach, which is licensing, education, and enforcement. Page 40, you will see our educational efforts and our public awareness and education uh, through Fatal Choices, our mobile community outreach unit, Buyers Beware, alcohol awareness poster contests, and presentations that we uh, do, multiple of presentations that we do uh, throughout the state at schools, uh, media, through media contracts that we have and press releases. Uh, further in our education efforts, you'll see license, licensee education programs, uh, our manager's training seminar, our brochure's education training seminar, total education training seminar for our um, licensee servers, and then uh, liquor and wine outlet training seminars and our safe stores. Um, we have moved during the pandemic to a virtual platform so that there was no pause in any of our training efforts. Moving on to page 42, uh, continuing with our education efforts uh, for law enforcement training. We do law enforcement training for uh, liquor establishment security uh, training, which is the door uh, personnel uh, at our licensees establishments, uh, advanced roadside impaired driving enforcement, 
which is advanced field sobriety for law enforcement throughout the state, drug impairment training for education professionals. That's for your school staff um, and any education professionals that would uh, that feel that this training might benefit them on a daily basis. Uh, fictitious ID training and drug recognition expert candidate school that we actually run uh, statewide for all the DREs throughout the state. Moving to page 43, liquor licenses. Uh, you'll see our liquor license types. Uh, uh, we have 50 li liquor licenses. Uh, that's debatable between our um, brew pub and nano uh, licenses. Uh, it fluctuates between uh, 46 and 50. Um, moving down to the bottom of the page, as stated before, uh, just defining our on-premise establishments and our off-premise establishments. Moving to page 44, number of liquor licenses and revenue collected, as you will see for calendar, uh, calendar year end, 2020, uh, 5,661 total licensees. Um, and FY20 revenue, uh, total of 17,707,808. Uh, Moving to page 45, uh, you'll see our education and awareness outreach, uh, our, two our 2020 trainings, uh, we had a total of persons trained, uh, 5,364. And our 2020 public awareness events um, was 29,440. And you see pictures down below just outlining what those events are. Staffing levels for sworn and civilian positions within the division, sworn staffing levels. Uh, you, you do see a, a drop uh, from 2009 to 2020 of 26 to 21 uh, sworn positions. Uh, we currently have one uh, vacant uh, position. Civilian staffing in 2020, uh, 12 full-time staff members and currently have one vacancy. On page 47, uh, active licenses uh, and permits and, and field officers. Uh, active licenses, again, 5,661. Uh, total field investigators, full-time investigators are 15. And our licensee to investigator ratio is 337.4 to one. Uh, page 48. Tax collection and auditing, license types assigned to auditing personnel. Uh, you can see them listed down below. Uh, active licensees are currently 2031 and 2020. We had have a total of three auditors uh, overseeing those uh, licensees. And that staffing level has been unchanged over the past decade. Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Well, uh, Representative uh, Herbert, Herbert has his hand up again. <laughs> yes, Chris. Uh, the, the, the ratios you just put up, 377 licensees, was it uh, to one? Um, is that uh, sufficient? <laughs> that sounds like a lot of places an investigator has to go to. I'm, it I'm just, is. Uh, and and I'm, I'm very proud to report that we reach out and touch every one of those licensed establishments. Um, can you always use more personnel? Of course you can, but I think we're showing that the work ethic in the division is beyond reproach and, and they're, they're doing an awesome job at uh, not only touching these uh, licensed establishments, but growing a very, very good relationship that we have proven throughout the uh, pandemic. And that's been our success in the last four years. One more question, if I might, Certainly. Mr. Chair. Uh, same thing on the auditor side. I, I'm not that familiar 
uh, with what the, all the auditors do, but having three auditors for the entire state, that sounds to me, uh, a, I don't know. I just, uh, it unchanged for the past decade. I guess nothing's changed in the past 10 years, but um, I'm just curious, same kind of question. Do you need more auditors? Thank you for your question. Um, we have actually in this area, we have moved to a hybrid on our sworn side. So our, uh, invest, our sworn investigators are actually cross-trained and sometimes actually go out with the civilian auditors. Uh, but again, uh, it would be the same answer. Of course, uh, again, we are in the high 90 percentile on, in this area. Um, there's always room to grow. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's, it definitely is one of those areas that hasn't, they have done a great job back there. I say back there because as the office is structured, they're in the back of the office, uh, but they get the, uh, the primary attention of all of us. So these are, these are civilian uh, people, they're not uh, state employees? They are state employees, but they are civilians. They're not sworn. Okay, they do you. not have law enforcement authority, but they do have administrative authority. Thank you. Yeah, Thank it, you. I mean, I, you have to, you know, the, the, all these uh, beverage managers and wine and every, everybody else is also, you also have a federal license. Um, so there, there's no reason why anybody's going to want to commit fraud in terms of uh, their auditing numbers. Um, and so we are, you know, we, uh, we, we do a good job of, you know, staying on top of these licensees and, you know, they do, they do file their audit, you know, their mo you know, monthly. And uh, so there, there's, you know, it, it, the system is pretty streamlined and works fairly well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, uh, uh, Mr. Yep. Chairman, on 49, 50, 51, are just some of the uh, accolades and accomplishments that the Liquor Commission has received over the last five or six years. So we just wanted to make sure that those were listed and, uh, and duly noted. And that's our presentation. We'd be happy to take any questions from the committee uh, that anyone might have. Yeah, well, Thank I see you you're number three there for the bourbon, but I still can't get my Buffalo Trace anymore. You know, what's going on? <laughs> getting <more. laughs> uh, Chairman, so I hope that you our uh, auction to uh, our online auction and get your name in there so we can pull your name out of the hat. <laughs> <laughs> That's good to hear. <laughs> so, uh, yes, uh, Representative Bielo. All right. Um, I have a question about the uh, tagline, New Hampshire made and made in New Hampshire. Did you have a difficult time with um, using New Hampshire made? No, no. Uh, when we did that, we, uh, we have partnered with the New Hampshire made folks in our stores okay. a number of times. And if, and if you've noted at our highway stores in Hampton, we allow them space on both sides of the highway. Uh, and that space is, has been given to them for a number of years and it is their most profitable uh, profit center. So as the, the RFP comes out to rebuild those stores, we will ask uh, that, th that those uh, locations be kept in place so that that revenue stream isn't uh, upset for, for that group. They're great partners and they do a great job. Yeah, and uh, uh, Another question? Further question, you may inquire. Um, social clubs. Are there new social clubs that, that are being um, licensed or is that, are you, are, they phase, are you phasing out social clubs for the state? There, there is no effort to phase out social clubs. Um, I don't have the number in front of me. Uh, our license, believe it or not, during the pandemic, our license applications are up. Um, but I don't know of any social clubs that are, uh, are in the queue right now. And, uh, with the, um, Question social clubs, I'll oh, follow up, uh, with the social clubs, do they need to sell food in the social clubs to be able to serve liquor? Has there, that changed? That, that has not, no. So you can just sell liquor in a social no. club? 
actually there is no there is a food requirement that they uh, adhere to most most social clubs have a, a restaurant type uh, facility within it all right thank you okay uh, representative Amon. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the uh, Liquor Commission for your presentation. Um, I have a question about uh, enforcement. Uh, I guess I guess it's enforcement and education. Is that what you call that room? Yes, so in in New York, uh, Governor Cuomo has been having uh, you know, pandemic related press conferences. And he often says uh, that his mandates will be enforced using New York's, uh, whatever they call their liquor commission in New York, uh, that restaurants uh, might have their liquor license revoked if they don't follow the, the mandates. Is that happening here in New Hampshire? Are you, are you being used to enforce a, a mask mandate? Uh, no, no, we have a we have a, a mandate, uh, a rule that's in place that uh, we work with the AG's office, uh, and we, you know, that mandate is, has uh, been passed to us that you know people need to be socially distanced and they need to have masks on in those locations. So, we so have, have you have you issued any fines related to that mandate? Yes, we have. And is, is there a list of the, those businesses that have been fined somewhere? Absolutely, there is. And, and how, how often does that happen? How many have there, have there been so far? Off the top of my head, I wouldn't know, but I'd be happy to get you the information, Representative. Yeah, if you could, that would be great. Sure. Thank you. Happy to, happy to do it. And I, so uh, date, uh, business, uh, amount of a fine, or what, what the enforcement action was? Yep, that would all be included. Absolutely, that will all be included. Great, thank you. Any other questions from the members? Okay. Uh, well, thank you guys very much for your presentation. Uh, we uh, appreciate it. Um, uh, uh, we do do have some liquor bills this year, and I know, see that Don's uh, last. Tuesday, uh, you guys, or yesterday, or Monday, you guys had Senate bills, and uh, would seem to have uh, got a good receiving. So we'll we'll hope for look forward to seeing seeing those bills in our second half. So uh, with that, I guess we're we're all. What time is it now? Oh, we're a little little ahead of schedule. Okay, um, I would say, Representative Bilo, your question about Made in Hampshire is actually has been an ongoing issue, somewhat for the for the commission and. Was, was in terms of labeling requirements and what uh, products and what they can be labeled. Um, and that issue has been tossed around a lot of times. And, and as, as, uh, I don't know, help me out, uh, Mr. Chairman. I don't think we ever ever got a resolution of the problem to, of, of what, what you can say on your bottle of Made in New Hampshire. No, I, I believe uh, last session there was passed that uh, it would be uh, Made in New Hampshire produced and bottled. I'm not sure off the top of my head what statute that was, but we can pass it along to you, Mr. Chairman. Um, because as, as uh, there, there's a lot of different ways to to make liquor and and how to yeah. <laughs> and uh, and and each industry has its own unique uh, issues. Uh, uh, wine. The fact, the question is, where are the grapes grown? Um, New Hampshire is not the best place to be growing grapes, uh, and I understand that nobody really attempts to grow red red wines here in New Hampshire, uh, and that's all imported uh, grape you know, grape juice. So the question is, then you know what where where's made in New Hampshire? If you're um, if you know, in terms of you know I guess if it's aged in the oak barrels, you can prove it. You oh, okay, that's New Hampshire enough. So and then uh, we also have a um, an, uh, another oddball product that's out there for distilled. And, um, and I say it only because I love the title, they're, they're rectified. And a rectified um, is that they take the raw product 
Um, and I guess I won't well, mention the name, but there's a company in Salem that makes a limoncello that uh, that uh, imports uh, a, by the truckload uh, the raw vodka, and then they take the, the lemons and the, and the sugar and they make a rectified product. We also have a major rectifier in Londonderry. Is it? Am I get that right? Londonderry. We're That's correct, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. And uh, so the the it's not so much of an issue why how they do it and how they produce it we're we're okay with that uh, but it becomes more of a problem and that is that we actually have benefits for someone who is in New Hampshire so we uh, for instance when you store your uh, your wines or products in their bonded warehouse we waive the fee is that is that correct Mr. Chairman that is correct. So, so we're, we're somewhat conscious of this uh, you know, entity that's in, in Londonderry, who is a uh, nationwide distributor or manufacturer of a product um, and they are rectifying and, and, uh, but they are in New Hampshire. And so we, we, we have an ongoing discussion about their, their bonding. So uh, these are kind of nuances of what goes on. Yes, yes, go ahead, Jane. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I have one other question about um, out-of-state um, buyers. How much can, uh, and it's probably not just out-of-state, what is the limit um, of uh, alcoholic beverages that they can purchase in a liquor store? Is it $20,000 limit per individual? There is no state law that limits the amount that someone could buy in one of our stores, our representative. But having um, said that, if yeah. you spend ten thousand dollars or more, we have another federal law that requires us to report the bank. Well, there's a there's a there's a requirement, but that's on uh, only the sale of cash. Ten thousand dollars or cash. more cash okay. sale. We have to fill out a, a report for the IRS, which we submit. But there is no law in the state of New Hampshire that prohibits us from selling any amount of alcohol to anyone from out of state. And when they bring that product, and when they bring that product into their state representative, they need to pay the tax in their state. That's, that, that's where people run afoul of the law. If they choose not to pay the tax in their state when they bring back that amount of alcohol or any amount of alcohol above the, the limits of that particular state, and each state is different. Uh, right. Representative Imran has another question. Go ahead, Keith. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thanks again for taking my question. Uh, on the previous question, I think that's called the New Hampshire Advantage, right? If we want people yes. to purchase thing, things in our state. Um, Absolutely is. There's a great program uh, where it's a, it's a bottle that's being sold at the state store uh, that looks like the state capital. And I can't remember the name of it. I think it's a bourbon. Um, yes. And that's a program to raise money to uh, renovate the Hall of Flags at the state house. Isn't that correct? That is correct, Representative. What's the status of that program? Is that has that been successful? Has it raised enough funds to make a difference? It's it's been it's been very successful, and the, I don't have the amount of money that we've raised off the top of my head, but I think we're on the fifth bottle. Uh, we've, we've five different bottles that we've done to help raise okay. money for the bottle flag. Yep. And there's more coming. Is that bottled out of state? That, is, that whiskey is from Kentucky and it's bottled in Massachusetts by M.S. Walker. I who's, just, that's... One, who's one of our uh, broker partners. Okay. And the design and manufacture of the bottle, because it does look like the state house with the little, uh, you know, golden dome on top. How, where was that manufactured, and and uh, how much overhead did that cost to customize the bottle? I'm not, I'm not sure. We're we're passed along a cost per bottle with the alcohol in it. So the breakdown okay. of the cost of bottle versus alcohol. I'm not sure of. Okay, I mean, it's, I think it's reasonably priced. Thank you. And the commission, and we've been doing these bottles for for ages, for decades. And uh, many, many oh, years. neat. Private label stuff, but I have to admit myself personally, I've never, never been that. 
Good. I think it's your responsibility. <laughs> you have to buy at least one, right? <laughs> I buy one. Too, but Thank I, you. I, I, wouldn't, I don't really drink it. <laughs> um, so be, uh, before we leave, uh, I do I, I remember that Aiden is online. And because Aiden will be coming in front of the committee, Aiden, do you mind um, uh, main, uh, d- uh, d- just introducing yourself a little bit just so everybody knows who you are? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is Aiden Moore. I uh, currently function as the legal coordinator with the Liquor Commission. Um, I work uh, under the direction of the chairman and in collaboration with the other senior uh, uh, managers at the commission. Um, I am often a person who will provide you with some historical uh, context of some statutes. Um, I began my career with the commission in 1981 and uh, served in the enforcement division for roughly 25 years, retiring as the uh, chief of enforcement. And uh, so therefore I do have a a little history on some of the previous uh, laws that were created, along with Representative Hunt, we go way back and trying to uh, provide (laughs) and provide you with uh, information that is useful for you as you evaluate the uh, legislation coming before you. So I'm, I'm happy to look forward to working with you um, in the future. And if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to contact me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Chairman. Yeah, no, I, uh, um, just it, part of this orientation is, you know, when people have questions. So uh, in, in general, we would say that you know, if people have uh, issues in any particular bill, they should be contacting Aiden in terms of directly and inter- in most of the issues. That's correct, Mr. Thank Chairman. You. Thank you. Yeah. And thank you for introducing me. Greatly yeah. appreciate it. Well, I, I, know I would never want to overlook my fellow BU graduate, but, uh, but uh, Aiden, Aiden, uh, Aiden was around when I passed my very first liquor, <laughs> liquor bill, the direct shipping. And I'm happy to see direct shipping's up over a million now, million three. So I know that I'm bringing lots of good revenue in the state with that, with that uh, awesome piece of of legislation. So. You, had that, right. you had that crystal ball working there, Mr. Chair. Yeah, right. Well, I, I was very lucky that I had a, uh, a, a, a chairman at that time who was uh, at least open to the idea, the concept of it, and, and could see could see the potential. So that was that was a good thing. But but I would say that chairman, there's nothing like the chairman we have now. Um, how, how long have you been chair, uh, Joe, now? Uh, 10, 10 years. 10 years. So we have an excellent working relationship, um, even though I, um, I will often comment that our liquor laws are a little Byzantine and a little confusing and a little why we do what we do. You know, when you hear that 50 licenses and um, there, there's, there's a lot of explanation that goes on on how we got to where we are. Um, so, so, uh, I know for, for all your new members, it's, it'll be a little bit of a learning curve, but in the end of the day, um, uh, I think we do, you know, we, we have an excellent organization bringing in, uh, more revenue than any other state can ever imagine. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. thank you very much. And the only thing I'd like to add, Mr. Chairman, to the kudos for myself is the team that we have here at the Liquor Commission. And, and I mean that sincerely, we have a great team of folks that work very hard every day in our stores, here at headquarters and in enforcement. And uh, we appreciate everything that everyone does for us to keep our business running. So thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Well, thank you all for you know doing an outstanding job. And, and I still want you to, you know, change his Mark's title back to the old chief enforcer. I just love that title, chief enforcer. <laughs> Director, I don't know, director. I don't know. I, I've always liked it. With, I run two uh, titles. <laughs> <laughs> I just like chief enforcer. So, all right. Well, thank you very much. And, uh, and you guys uh, can stay on. I guess I have to, I don't know, I have to demote you from, from being a panelist. But um, otherwise, uh, we're at 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock. So now we should have securities. So um, I will ask the securities department. I see Barry. Um, would you just raise your hands? Is anybody, you got anybody else working with you here, Barry? Uh, let me uh, promote you to a panelist. Okay. Is there anybody else, Barry, or are you, you here? You, you have to unmute yourself. I don't control your mute, Barry. If you can hear me, if he's there, 
Barry. <laughs> there you go. And now you turn up your volume. <laughs> I guess I don't know. Uh, are you are because I'm not muting you, Barry. So if it's if there's a volume problem, Mike, Mike, it's your end. I can see you now. How is that, Representative? There you go. Awesome. Okay. Great. All right. All right. We're your your link is very slow. You're a little choppy at, the, at our end here. Okay. Um. Excuse me, Representative Hunt. This is Christina Dyer. It may work better for him to turn his audio, his video off, so that we can hear the audio. Okay, you hear that, Barry? Turn your okay. video off, so maybe, maybe just the audio. I hope you're at home, not at the office, and we have slow, oh. slow internet at the office. <laughs> That improve matters. All right. Well, why don't you just keep talking? Let's see what happens. Okay. Um, um, of the committee, uh, at least get the um, representative Hunter. Are you able to uh, hear this? Uh, well, let's just keep going. Maybe it's it's speed is catching up. Let's see. Oh, let's see okay. Uh, but yes, I am uh, in the office. Um, um, and it, it just may be a function of, of our uh, internet connection. But uh, I'd first like uh, to say thank you very much for in inviting us uh, to this meeting, um, uh, this hearing, I should say, uh, to present and provide some of the committee members a, an overview uh, of, of the Bureau and its our, our primary functions. Um, just uh, as a as a general statement, the, the Bureau of Securities is re essentially responsible for the protection of New Hampshire investors through the enforcement of RSA 421B. Our all that is really to in the state, educate the best to yeah, this is this is this is not working. This is not going well, Barry. Um, do you mind just logging out and close out your Zoom and start start afresh? Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, well, I guess this we're gonna. This won't be the first time I'm sure that this occurs. But hopefully. Um, so Christina, will, when he comes back in, will he be in uh, under panelists or attendees if, because I promoted him? He'll come in as an attendee. We can bump him back up. Um, if the problem persists, it may be best to just have him call in on the phone and that way we can hear the audio. But I don't know if he has a presentation. If he does, he can send it to me and we could put it up. Right, right. Okay. Representative Hunt, should you yes. should you be muted? Would that help? Sometimes if there's just one person that's um, not muted, it might interfere with the presentation. I'm not sure. I, I can certainly try that, but you know. If this silence continues, I will fall asleep. Uh, 
Okay, so I'll tell some stories. Um, so securities is actually one of the newest of, of all our different divisions. Uh, when I just got elected back in back in the late 80s, um, it was a standalone division. And then at the time, uh, the decision was that it, that uh, it should be the model, the business model should change. And so now securities is actually under the Secretary of State's office. So, um, so technically Bill Gardner is in charge. Um, and so Barry, who is our director of securities, um, is you know obviously going to be making the presentation when, when we get him back here. Um, and the what's interesting about securities is that um, we have a we have a, a we, have, we it is a big revenue for the state. We do uh, no okay. Barry's back now. Okay. Um, panelists let's see how this works okay all right okay barry you're in let's see what happens all right okay how was that that's great so far both audio and video audio and video you're good oh terrific what I, I i do pardon uh excuse me for the delay i decided really just to power off my pc and clear out the ram and and uh that's way to do it this all works Okay, well, we'll start again. Again, my apologies uh, to the committee. Uh, my name is Barry Glennon, and I'm the uh, director of the New Hampshire Bureau of Securities Regulation. Uh, with me here today is Jeff Spill. Jeff is the deputy director of enforcement uh, here within the bureau. He will also be uh, presenting today, and uh, he's to my left. But we'll we'll just kind of move the camera when okay. we get to, okay. get to Jeff. Um, the role really of, of the New Hampshire Bureau of Securities is essentially to protect um, New Hampshire investors through the enforcement of New Hampshire RSA 421B, which is our controlling statute. Essentially, our role is really to promote capital uh, formation uh, in this. The investment. Oh, great. To preserve. Uh. Uh, um, essentially making sure that so uh, Barry, your 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 computer is not buffering well so um i guess i would ask you to just call in do you have the call in the phone call call in um yes i do okay all right we're gonna so, do the conference call. Just, just leave that alone and call it in and i don't know okay. So we have no graphics. Oh, so you did have a presentation, huh? Yes. Ouch. Okay, well, Ouch. I guess we can try. You you're seem to be better at the moment. Okay. Can you see, uh, can you see my PowerPoint representative? Uh, have you have you put it up? Because no, we, have, we don't see it yet. Have you, so you're, I think that uh, it may require that you share. Uh, well, we... An understanding is you, I, I have, uh, you, you are a panelist and I'm allowing you to share. Okay. Well, I would say, uh, who can start? Well, no, I mean, I, let me put, click, who can start sharing when someone else is sharing. No, you know, not, someone else is not sharing. So, but yeah, you should be able to share. Okay. Uh, Let's try this now. All right. There we go. Started. There we go. How's that, Representative? That, that works. That's good. Okay, but you just have uh, audio, correct? Uh, no, we actually have visual. We oh, can see right. oh. the screen. Terrific for now. All right. So um, I'll, I'll just jump uh, right into it because we'll be done our 30 minutes before, before you know it. Um, the New Hampshire uh, Department of State Bureau of Securities is uh, organized under the Secretary of State's office. Uh, the Secretary of State is responsible, as you know, for elections, but also corporations, uh, uh, UCC, vital records, uh, state archives, but also uh, the Bureau of Securities. Our, uh, our primary uh, functions, as I said, is really in investor protection, uh, handling uh, investor complaints, also the registration of broker dealers uh, and investment advisors. 
I'll just, brief, the, I'll just briefly hit upon the major functions uh, of the Bureau. Uh, as I said, licensing of broker dealers and investment advisors is, is a significant task uh, here in the state, uh, as well as the registration of securities products that are sold to uh, New Hampshire residents. We also conduct uh, field examinations of all the broker dealers, uh, investment advisors, and their branch offices, which are scattered uh, throughout the state, and uh, uh, to ensure that they are in compliance with uh, securities laws. We also, uh, we have uh, outreach, investor ed education outreach. Uh, at this time, it's, it's limited because of uh, COVID-19 restrictions. However, we have just been primarily focusing on uh, radio uh, type uh, interviews. Uh, WGIR has been a great supporter uh, with a two hour program on Saturdays and a half hour uh, with, uh, with them on, on Thursdays, uh, at least uh, four times a year. And then our, our, one of our more significant activities involves uh, enforcement, unfortunately, uh, for those who have uh, violated uh, state statute. Jeff Spill will be providing you with uh, a little bit more insight as far as uh, some of the things that, that we see and things that we do uh, as a bureau when it comes uh, to enforcement. We are a self-funded agency. Um, all of our expenses are paid through the fines and penalties derived through enforcement actions. However, uh, the revenue that we generate uh, by way of securities registrations, um, which is really uh, quite significant, uh, is uh, uh, this, this fiscal year will be, we project to be $43 million, which uh, go directly uh, to the general fund. And we do that um, with a, a 12 member staff, that's from the front end receptionist to, to the director of the bureau. So we do operate, I think, you know, fairly leanly, although the director could use a, a few pounds to lose, but uh, we try to be lean. As far as uh, the licensing and registration function, again, this is a very important role in that we are really the gatekeeper for agents uh, and firms that, that decide to do business in the state. Um, they are required uh, to uh, uh, register uh, with, with the Bureau, um, as well as uh, any firm that is uh, anyone who out looking to raise capital and doing a securities offering that they file those offerings with us and we perform a qualitative review of, of those offerings. But more significantly is really the broker dealer and investment advisor side. Uh, in terms of uh, broker dealers, as you can see here on the slide, uh, we license a uh, little over uh, 1,200 um, broker dealers. Uh, now, they are not all resident here in the state. Uh, they're scattered throughout the country, uh, but we do have a significant presence clearly uh, here in the state in terms of firms. We have over 118,000 registered representatives that we have uh, registered with us every year. I can see Representative Hunt's uh, head shaking left and right. Now, again, they are not all physically here uh, in the state. Uh, however, they are uh, licensed uh, to do business here in the state and they reach clients by way of, you know, phone. How much do you hit them up on, a, on an annual basis? Do they, they pay? A the, uh, annual, the renewal fee is just uh, $100. Um, per licensee, uh, which is, I think, reasonable. We try to be reasonable in relation to what other states uh, also charge. But there, there's really a significant number. And as you can see, uh, 2,394 of investment advisors and over 4,500 investment advisor representatives. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a large number for a good reason. And that is that New Hampshire residing, of course, in the Northeast, we really are a wealth center in, in the country. A lot of people are in the state, come to New Hampshire for a good reason, besides um, you know, all of the, the benefits of living in the state and, and our favorable tax environment. It's really a great place for retirees. And with that, you have a more older population. I think we are, in terms of our median age, it's, uh, it's older. We're actually older in terms of median age than the state of Florida, believe it or not. So because we are a wealth center, because we have a more elderly population, uh, we see uh, a lot of assets um, here that need to be managed and broker dealers and investment advisors recognize that, which is why we, we really have such a sizable number. Now, along with that, and, and Jeff Spill will discuss this further, um, because we are a wealth center, those scammers, those who commit fraud, those who violate statute really find New Hampshire attractive because 
scammers go where the money is. And so we're never without any number of cases going on at any given time from out of state, from out of state entities, firms, or unregistered uh, individuals. Um, it, it really is, uh, it, it's a significant amount of activity, unfortunately, but that's, that's really what we're here for. Uh, we also uh, register a large number of securities products. The vast majority of those are mutual funds. Uh, somewhere in the area of 15,000 mutual funds are registered in New Hampshire and they pay an annual fee, renewal fee of $1,000 per fund. So it's a significant source uh, of revenue uh, for, for the state of New Hampshire. We also perform uh, in-person audits. They're done on an unannounced basis. Certainly with COVID-19, we've had real limitations and we've been respecting uh, you know, COVID protections for those in entities that we regulate. Uh, we transitioned to more of a desk audit type of format for field examinations, meaning we would reach out to them by phone and by way of a uh, video conference like this, sometimes with a better connection, and, uh, and then ask them to provide us information and actually conduct interviews over the phone. But the ideal environment really is to be able to conduct them on an in-person in basis and it's really done unannounced. Uh, so um, it's, it's not like as if they could prepare you know, for the exam. The exam is roughly a one to two days. It's not like an IRS exam um, that you might see go on for quite some time. Uh, we do approximately one, 100 exams on, on an annual basis. Um, uh, this year, I, I still think we'll be at that number given the number of desk exams we've done. And, and you may ask, well, how do we select them, it's not like it's necessarily just because they were examined four years ago and due for an exam. We actually have a, a more formal risk-based um, uh, process for determining who and what firm really in what branch office should be examined on a more regular basis based upon what we may have experienced in a prior review. Uh, certainly if it's a new office, we will um, uh, examine them with then make certain evaluations and it's often uh, still running there in Concord. It, you're, you're, you're slowing down again here. Still coming in okay? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Okay, well, keep going. Yeah. We also... Uh, uh, this uh, there are three uh, in which requirements to them uh, with say five feet on site exams of how are we doing? Horrible. Um, well, <laughs> Let's talk slowly. I don't know. I don't know. I don't, I don't know what, what's going on here. But I guess keep going. How much more have we got of this? Uh, yeah. Like you keep freezing. You keep going and freezing. Can you? Yeah. Uh, uh, Excuse me, uh, Representative Hunt. Um, Mr. Glenn, did you want to try and call in with the telephone and uh, just keep your, your video on, but disconnect the audio so that at least we can hear you? Okay, good idea. Uh, you have a phone, phone barrier, are you calling? Yeah. So what you can do is uh, where you have the mute button at the bottom, there's a little arrow. If you, uh, it will say um, switch to phone audio and then, or leave computer audio rather, and then you can use the phone. Right, but you just hit, you have to call log in separately with the phone, we call in with the phone.
Um, just for anybody else who's listening, just to remind everybody that we will uh, invite lobbyists to introduce themselves at 1115. All right, so it looks like we have a caller um, in attendees. I don't know if that caller was there before, but I don't think so. I, I wasn't, okay. So do I-, I Allow to talk and we'll ask. Allow to talk, yep, okay. Is it, and he's he's muted on his end. How does he come um, Star six will unmute. So caller, if, that, if you are um, Mr. Glennon, could you press star six to unmute? If that's him, <laughs> right? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> uh, I don't know. See, you know, it's funny because it has the last three digits. I can't tell whether it's a two seven one number, knowing that it would that would be a state number, but that, that's all right. Asterisks. Uh, so whoever is calling in, and your last three digits is four five nine. Do you mind just hitting star six so we can? Oh, here's another one just popped up. Oh, okay, maybe that's it then. Let's. Uh... All right, I'm gonna click this one to allow to talk. Okay, so Barry, if that's you, star six, do you unmute yourself? Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. okay. All right, so. Okay, now you got to the echo in here. Turn the audio off on your computer or you're gonna get a lot of feedback. Okay. How's that now? That's perfect. Great. Okay, so I, <laughs> I guess for you, did I, you where did I leave off? Uh, not sure where you were. Um, That's cool. You had you had email contacts address uh, up for people. I think is what I saw. I stopped the screen share so that we would give him some confidentiality. Uh, so he'll just have to start the screen okay. share again. We were we were seeing your desktop. <laughs> so you can you can start sharing again. Okay. Okay. Cool. There. Yep, that's up. I can see that. Great. Okay. Uh, but now I can't hear you. Are you you're still on the phone, I'm right? I'm here. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. So in terms of uh, audio, did you hear anything about licensing? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, uh, I, we talked about licensing and I was uh, remarking you know, about how many registered broker dealer agents, which okay. I think we're bringing in over a million dollars of licensing them, hundred bucks a year. So let's try the next screen. Okay. Uh, field examinations. Hopefully this is new ground. <laughs> oh, you did it. Yeah, but I don't know if it can be heard actually uh, on audits. Okay. Okay. So we do conduct uh, field audits of our broker dealer offices and investment advisory offices. Uh, they are done typically on an unannounced basis. Uh, because of COVID, we've had some restrictions clearly being able to visit those offices. Uh, but have reverted, have reverted to uh, desk examinations, which are effective. We took the low risk entities and, and examined them uh, rather than what we would deem some of the higher risk um, offices um, around the state. That has been going uh, very well, but otherwise they're typically done on an unannounced basis to determine that whether they have actually uh, complied uh, with uh, securities laws, including disclosure, 
review of client files for product suitability and, and a number of other uh, metrics that we actually look at. Uh, but we do a little over, typically on a good year, over 100 uh, exams uh, with two examiners. We're also responsible for the oversight of risk pools pursuant to RSA uh, 5B. There are three such pools uh, in the state, Health Trust in Hampshire being one of the largest ones. Um, they have certain uh, annual uh, financial filings and also uh, uh, also actuarial filings that are uh, made with the Secretary of State's office each year. And we monitor those. Uh, we look at those as well as do in-person examinations uh, of, of the risk pools. But our, one of our uh, more significant functions really is, uh, you know, protection of New Hampshire investors and responding to uh, those who may have been harmed by either one of our licensees or uh, unlicensed individuals that um, uh, are uh, trying to uh, commit fraud or any form of misrepresentation uh, to New Hampshire investors. Um, Jeff Spill is our Deputy Director of Enforcement. He's here, unfortunately, because of, of, uh, of uh, video issues. I, I can't portray him there, at least uh, I don't know if I can. I don't dare. I don't want to lose our signal. But uh, uh, Jeff has been uh, with the Bureau for a little over 21 years now at this point uh, and uh, has been uh, Deputy uh, Director of Enforcement for that entire period. So I'll turn it over to Jeff to talk a little bit about uh, what we do in that area. Jeff? Good morning and thank you for this opportunity to address the committee. Um, as Barry said, I'm in charge of enforcement and uh, the two main ways we start an enforcement matter is through a written complaint or a complaint by a resident of the state of New Hampshire. We can also get complaints from outer state individuals who do business in New Hampshire or if the transaction occurred in New Hampshire. And the other way is through uh, investigations that we initiate on our own. Uh, the statute 421B has sweeping authority for us to conduct investigations accumulate evidence, take testimony under oath, and the culmination of that, if we determine that the statute has been violated, is we have a hearings process, which is headed up by a hearings examiner appointed by the Secretary of State, usually somebody from our office, and uh, the decisions that are made can render sanctions which range from restitution paid to the harmed investor, disgorgement of ill-gotten gains, administrative fines and costs of our investigation are the primary tools we utilize. We can also bar individuals, firms, and, and uh, agents that have violated the law. Typically, we get about 70 uh, complaints and uh, investigations. Uh, we usually uh, bring about half of those as actual enforcement matters. Uh, the other half we would close as, as uh not actionable, either because there's a lack of evidence or maybe um, some other uh, reason that precludes us from going forward. Uh, we also, uh, short of actually um, bringing an enforcement action, can provide assistance to the public on uh, questions of uh, need for the, for the individual. It could be a question about their account. It could be a problem they're having with an agent or a firm. It could be, um, you know, just having them uh, navigate a particular issue uh, that they want to see resolved. Um, so we, we've kind of pride ourselves in being an open door policy for uh, enforcement action and for enforcing the statutes. We don't turn away any complaints. We don't um, foreclose anybody due to um, dollar amounts or due to um, whether or not there's another agency investigating and we handle um, basically all issues that come before us in one way or another. We also work with other agencies uh, on a parallel basis or on a global basis. We work with the Department of Justice, State of New Hampshire, Department of Justice, United States, uh, the, the local county prosecutors. We do not have criminal authority. We have civil authority, so we can work with criminal agencies to bring criminal charges. We also work with our securities industry counterparts, which is FINRA, the uh, Self-Regulatory Organization, and the Securities and Exchange Commission, which is our federal counterpart. 
Um, you may be interested to know how COVID has affected enforcement and, and we've been able to navigate through that very effectively, we've been able to keep up our number of actions, we've been able to keep up our uh, sanctioning power. Uh, we have done hearings and taken testimony remotely to uh, satisfy social distancing and keep people safe. With respect to um, other enforcement type issues uh, that we deal with, um, there is a new statute online called Financial Exploitation of Vulnerable Adults. That has been put in place to um, protect vulnerable adults from uh, scammers in the sense that uh, scammers can gain access, illegal access to their accounts or um, through their scam um, deceive vulnerable adults in uh, either believing that they are dealing with a real person or a real firm or a real securities transaction when it's actually fraudulent. And the way uh, we can effectively do that is not only through the enforcement process, but the statute allows the account to be frozen by the firm so that money can't be withdrawn uh, or so that um, funds are stabilized and uh, access is denied to the funds until such time as the Bureau can determine whether um, there's a, an enforcement action that needs to be taken or uh, safety precautions put in place. We also bring uh, what we call global enforcement issues along with other states and, other, and Canadian provinces. Uh, that is headed up by a national organization, which is the North American Securities Administrators Association. And members are, 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 of our staff are also very active with NASA, taking various roles um, and enforcement committees underneath uh, the NASA uh, corporate office. Um, some of the scams that we encounter uh, that have been a far-reaching far impact uh, nationally. Uh, romance scams where individuals pose uh, vulnerable doubts as a, rom a romantic interest, and through that romantic interest, uh, drain or withdraw funds illegally from the account. Uh, phony securities deals uh, where the securities product doesn't exist or doesn't do what is promised. Uh, phony securities... Um, products that, aren't, uh, that don't exist um, or phony securities uh, firms that don't actually exist. And a lot of this now is unfortunately perpetrated on the internet where people can log on and believe that they're dealing with actual people and actual firms when they're really scammers posing as such. And that's um, essentially uh, my presentation on, on enforcement. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, I'd also just uh, like to point out that um, uh, the Bureau has been operational in person here at the State House Annex. Uh, I think since May, we were out for a brief period, about six weeks, but then returned uh, to the Annex. Uh, we are located uh, on the third floor, um, so if you ever are in Concord, uh, we can, there are certain protections that can be taken uh, for you to be able to actually come in and, uh, and meet with us. Uh, if you want to hear more about uh, the Bureau, certainly I think the presentation and unfortunately technology has, uh, has maybe given you a very chopped version of, of what we do, and I sincerely apologize for that. Uh, we'll do what we can to correct, uh, to correct that in the future. Uh, but we are available uh, to meet with any members of the committee uh, um, as we go forward. We do not have any bills um, that, will be, that we intend to bring or have someone uh, sponsored before Commerce. However, there may be, you know, some other bills for which we have an interest in, so we'll be able to, you know, see you hopefully in person at, at some point. Uh, so, Mr. Chair, I'd uh, turn it back to you if, if you have any questions or any members of the committee. Okay, yeah, so just uh, take your share screen down so that I can see all my members and and, um, and then we can, is, is there anybody have have a question? Uh, I don't see any hands up, so um, so I, th I think we're good. So thank okay, you. Okay, well, thank you very much, and members of the committee. Well, actually, um, did, does Kevin want? Is Kevin around or Kevin? Uh, uh, Kevin unfortunately had a hearing that he had to attend. Okay. Uh, he was slated, however, uh, we did cover the licensing component yeah. uh, in field exams, which he is responsible for. Right, which he has been in front of the committee several times. Yes, he's also our, the legislative liaison with the committee. There you go. So, all right. 
uh, with that, uh, well, thank you very much. Sorry about the, the, the bugs, but that's the reason why we're doing this to try to iron these bugs out ahead of time. So. Uh, All right. Thank you very much. And uh, nice talking to you. Um, and, yeah. Christy, did you want to, Oh, you're just you want to say goodbye. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. All right. So 1035. So we're now going back to and again. I'm going to remind lobbyists at 1115. And so now I'm asking um, Tom, uh, Tom or Brandon, if you guys are there, just raise your hand so I can find you on the attendees list. All right. There's Tom. All right, Tom, I'm promoting you to a panelist. And Brandon, I am promoting you to a panelist. Okay, so we'll start off um, under the Attorney General's office. There are many different things there, but there are two divisions that um, that we are uh, their regulator. So um, why don't you go ahead? Um, we'll start start with Tom. Right, we have Tom first uh, from Charitable Trust. Great. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and hello to well uh, members of the committee. I recognize a number of you um, from past sessions and uh, glad to uh, see you on board again this year. Um, my name is Tom Donovan. I'm the Director of Charitable Trusts in the Attorney General's Office. And um, we're a, a small corner of the Attorney General's Office, but we're proud of the work that we do. Um, in, New, in 1943, New Hampshire be, became the first state to create an office dedicated to the oversight of charitable trusts and organizations. Um, historically, attorney general's office have oversight responsibility with respect to charitable assets. It goes all the way back to Queen Elizabeth I in 1601. Um, but um, for better or worse, attorney general's office kind of had it on the back burner for many years. But in 1943, uh, New Hampshire's legislature said, we need to uh, pay attention to the assets that people have left in their wills and trusts, et cetera, for charitable purposes and maybe aren't being used the way they are supposed to be. So our office um, requires uh, charitable trusts, charitable organizations to register with us and to file annual reports. Those annual reports include a financial statement. Um, they include a list of the board of directors and they include a conflict of interest statement. All of that information is available um, to the public. Unfortunately, um, we don't have all of that information posted online. I'd love to be able to do that the way you, the Secretary of State does it and someday we will. We are moving, um, and hopefully within the next month, we'll, we'll allow our charities to file these forms electronically, uh, which will make things a lot easier for them. Um, the next step after that will be to get the information posted so that uh, the public uh, will be able to see that. Um, we have about 11,000 organizations, um, charitable organizations that uh, report to us every year. Um, about two thirds of those, let's say around 6,500 of them are based here in New Hampshire. Um, the others are out of state organizations that either offer services here or are raising money from the public in New Hampshire. We have a set of eyes that reviews every one of the 11,000 annual reports that come in and we'll get back to organizations if they have is if we have issues with them and if there's a problem that emerges, we will begin an investigation. And uh, we have the authority to subpoena folks and bring them in and uh, may uh, conduct enforcement activities if necessary. We wanna make sure that the people who are donating money um, or uh, have contracts with the state government uh, are in fact uh, being well served by, by dealing with charitable organizations. And, and we're also, we, we like to say we would rather educate than regulate. We recognize that these are volunteer board members that are governing the organization and they're doing it uh, nights and weekends. And so we, again, we'd rather educate them than regulate them. And so we, we come at it with that um, 
viewpoint, we want to promote the uh, growth and prosperity of the nonprofit sector in New Hampshire because it is very important. And it, it, it includes everything from your local historical society, uh, your local little league, all the way up to um, Dartmouth College and the hospitals uh, on, the, on the higher side. Now, um, churches are exempt from reporting to us. Uh, however, to the extent that churches hold um, restricted funds, endowments, we do have oversight there to make sure that the donors who may have left money for a particular restricted purpose, that that restriction is honored. Um, we have a couple of other activities that we perform um, in, in our charitable trust unit. Um, healthcare acquisition transactions, and you probably know something about that. It seems that every hospital in the state wants to merge with every other hospital in the state. So the, for the past five years, we've been very busy. Um, we review those transactions um, with an eye towards seeing whether the board of directors conducted adequate due diligence. Was it in the best interest of the hospital itself? And is it in the best interest of the communities they serve? Sometimes um, the result of our review is that uh, we'll, we will let the, or the uh, transaction go forward, but we'll put some conditions on it. Um, or we may object to it. Uh, and we have some that are pending now, but uh, over half of the hospitals in the state have gone through some type of transaction that we've reviewed over the past five years and, and the activity continues. Another area we look at are conservation easement amendments. Most people, when they don't, when the, when conservation easements get created on a parcel of land, let's say somebody has 40 acres of woodlands or 40 acres of farmland, they might donate it or have a bargain sale to a conservation organization. Um, and then a few years down the, the road, maybe the, the, the landowner gets uh, second thoughts and, and says, well, wait a minute, um, you know, maybe I do want to put another house on that property or gee, maybe I do want to uh, start, you know, having weddings in the barn or something like that. And um, so we have a process to review those. In some cases, they may need to take a trip to court. But the, the bottom line is if, if somebody's donated a conservation easement saying that, that they'll never develop their property, um, you can't take that back. Um, and, and it's the obligation of the uh, conservation organization to enforce that. that that's why they hold it. Um, we also um, require the registration of um, professional fundraisers, folks who do, um, uh, who make those fun time dinner phone calls to you asking to donate money to the police relief association or a conservation group, et cetera. Um, they have a first amendment right to do that, uh, but we require them to register. We, we wanna see what the script is that, they're, that they are um, uh, giving out when they're calling people and we require a bond from that. And we do occasionally uh, investigate those organizations and, and there are some scam charities out there and we've shut them down together with um, offices like ours in other states. We also um, require the uh, notices of charitable gift annuities that, that um, uh, charities offer, and there may be a bill relating to that uh, in front of your committee. I haven't looked at the text of it, but there might be something that will come before your committee relating to that. Um, so that's the sort of work that we do. Um, and uh, if I were to say, is there, is there a trend that you're paying attention to? I would say it's online giving. Um, you, know, you know, people set up GoFundMe campaigns uh, a lot, and that's great. Um, if people set up a GoFundMe campaign to help pay their own medical bills or their pet's medical bills, et cetera, that is not charity in the technical sense. It's 
giving from by one individual to another individual is not charity that is uh, governed by us. So we don't review that. But a lot of charities have also found that online giving is a very efficient way to raise money. And um, the cost of doing so is much better than, than hiring those paid fundraisers. So we encourage charities to be using online giving. Um, they just need to be careful in how it's done. And um, um, you know, you have campaigns like Amazon Smiles, PayPal Giving Fund, uh, other ways that people can give. And there's a lot of creativity out there. We're, we're thinking that we, we don't have a lot of ways to keep an eye on it. We don't want to discourage that kind of giving. Um, but there have been some abuses. And so um, I'm not saying this year, but but in some year in the future, there might be something, some legislation for this committee to consider that will um, mainly make it clear to the public when they're giving what the what the fees are that the platforms are taking out, uh, who's really getting the money, et cetera. So that's the sort of thing we're looking at. But it's certainly making sure that people know it's not tax deductible. It, you know, if it's not a 501c3, you're, you're, you're giving money. You're not, don't try to get a donation. Well, and yeah, no, that's absolutely right, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman. So if, if you give, if I put up a, a campaign on GoFundMe for you to pay uh, the veterinary bills for my dog, um, you can't deduct that off of your taxes. It's going to be a 501c3 charity. Uh, and, and you're right, sometimes people get uh, confused about that. We also have some things for some political action committees that, that are maybe raising money on the web. Um, and people might also be uh, confused in saying, uh, hey, maybe I can deduct that. Well, you can't. Um, if, it's, if it's an advocacy organization, those donations are not tax deductible. It's, it's charitable. Some charitable organizations can do it advocacy they can't do political campaign type stuff so and and so that's that's another area where the public can get confused it's a very touchy issue yep yep great well thank you tom i appreciate that and uh, uh unless anybody has any particular questions for oh we do have a couple questions uh we'll start with you jane because you get your hand up first before you switch right yes so representative. thank you mr chair thank you tom for taking my question um, those um, calls that ask um, um, people for money for police fund or firemen fund, do you know how much money actually goes to uh, the police versus the people that administer the calls? So if they're registered with us, yes, we find out. And you'd be surprised to learn how little goes. Most of it goes oh. to those fundraisers. I mean, I, I would say you know, often it, less than 50% goes to those police and fire. And what a point in time you guys did a, a bad boy list. You had your list, of, uh, had a, yeah. you printed and, and, I, and some of them were like 10%. If yeah. That. Oh yeah. Sometimes 90% goes to the fundraiser and only 10% to the chair. Yeah. So you still maintain that list or you still have, I mean, haven't, I don't know. Um, so we have, yeah, we have it. We, you know, that's a good idea. Maybe we ought to publicize that again. Dust that list off again. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. especially you know in giving giving season so yeah. and, and and just to follow up i just want to make a comment um uh, mr donovan's office i mean they're so accessible and um, he'll spend as much time as he needs with you if you have any questions regarding nonprofits or any of the uh, matters that he brought forward today thanks tom yeah. thank you okay. uh next up is uh nita burrows representative burrows you have a thank question you, mr chair and thank you tom for taking my question um you mentioned that you prefer to educate than legislate. And, you know, I'm in a town, we have a ton of small nonprofits run by volunteers, but very often the board crosses over and, and takes over the executive director's function or the executive director is really managing the board. At what, what's, the, what's the tipping point for you in terms of taking action? Because uh, I'm just seeing this a lot. And again, I know it's volunteers, but I find it frustrating that they're not following, you know, they're not following laws. So we'll, um, it, when we hear about these situations, we'll talk to board members and saying, you know, your role is 
to be uh, leadership and govern. You're not there to manage or micromanage. And um, we, we've done a little bit of what I'd call marriage counseling. Um, between board members, the board of directors, and, and the executive director is who's in what lane, et cetera. But the, when the, the um, executive director reports to the board, uh, the board hires and fires the executive director. It's the one staff person that, that they supervise. But, but the board has to understand that um, if you don't like the executive director, maybe you can fire the person, but you got to let the executive director do his or her job. Thank you. And so uh, Representative Herbert has a question. Hello, Mr. Donovan, how are you? Fine, thanks. Um, would it be within the purview of the legislature to require that at least a minimum amount of the money raised go to, I mean, could we do that kind of thing? Or, or should we even try? Um, I'm, I would caution you, states have tried to do that, uh, and they've been slapped down at least three times by the U.S. Supreme Court, um, and that happened back in the 1980s, um, and yes, it was pretty common for states to have these things, and the paid fundraiser community is got great lawyers, and um, we're, we're pretty much limited to uh, registration and publication of, of their fees. That's it. Should we do a 501c3 to fund uh, taking it to the Supreme Court again? <laughs> <laughs> not a so, serious question. Right. We all, we all know, uh, you know, please put me on your do not call list. Uh, it should be everybody's mantra. Um, you know, when, when you get these, uh, these associations, I was rather surprised. I remember when we put in this bill to regulate this, Liz Hager from Concord actually was the sponsor. And, um, and I remember when we were first doing it and I was kind of amazed at uh, how the professionals and, and who do this and they're for and not necessarily um, with our, our fire or police and whatever. So uh, please put me on your do not call list. All right, well, thank you very much, Tom, it was great. And last but not least, we have Brandon from uh, the Attorney General's Office representing the Consumer Protection Division. And uh, good morning, Brandon. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be here in front of you to talk about the work of the Consumer Protection and Antitrust Bureau at the Department of Justice. Um, my name is Brandon Grodd. I am the Bureau Chief of this Bureau. Uh, we do a lot of different functions, um, but I'll, and I'll try to hit on each of them as much as I can. I know I have a time limit, but at don't, the, don't the, core of, the core of the work that we do in the Consumer Protection and Antitrust Bureau, uh, to sum it up, is those that are engaging in trade or commerce within the state, you know, those that are selling goods, selling services to consumers, we ensure and we ensure that they are acting fairly with consumers, we ensure that they are not deceiving consumers. We ensure that they are not working to create unfair um, pricing or price fixing or creating monopolies that would have an adverse effect on competition and on the consumers of the state of New Hampshire. And we do that through a variety of different functions. At the core of the work that we do is New Hampshire's Consumer Protection Act, which is RSA 358. And what the Consumer Protection Act does is it makes it illegal for those that are engaged in trade or commerce in the state of New Hampshire um, to do a variety of different things. They're, they're specifically listed in the statute, but the type of conduct that's generally prohibited is anything that is unfair or deceptive. And there are sp several specific examples of that, such as conduct like offering goods or services and representing them as something that they're not representing them to be of a specific quality when in fact that's not true or representing them to be endorsed by a specific organization when in fact that's not true um, things like that um, but then there's a general prohibition against any unfair or deceptive um, conduct in the process of engaging in trade or commerce in the state and so the way we enforce that statute 
is through a consumer protection hotline that's open five days a week. Anybody in the state can call in, call into our hotline, and they can talk to a real person. Uh, it used to be it used to be run 100% by volunteers. Uh, the pandemic has impacted that gratefully. I mean, greatly. Um, we do have a couple still, but um, we're much slower to respond than we used to be. It used to be that you could call in and talk to somebody instantly. Um, now uh, we have a little bit of a, a lag, but we do try to return all calls within 24 hours. Anyone that thinks that they've been wronged in trade or commerce in New Hampshire can call in, talk to a, a real person, and an attorney in this bureau will look at their problem and determine whether it's something that the Consumer Protection Bureau has the authority to take action on. We get about 7,500 calls and inquiries a year, and that number seems to be growing every year. Of that, we receive thousands of complaints every year that are actually amount to a potential violation of New Hampshire's Consumer Protection Act, for which we open an official complaint matter, uh, and we reach out to the business to try to resolve this. And so because of the volume and the limited resources that we have, you know, we, we receive a lot of stuff where we serve at, at almost in a mediation type role, you know, minor things. For example, you know, if um, a, so somebody, you know, contracts to build a house and, you know, there's a disagreement on, you know, the quality of what was going to be used and the you know, consumer complains to us and we're able to reach out to the, the person that built the house they're able to give their side of the story to us and we're able to say, well, you know, is there a solution here that can, you know, get both parties to a place where they're comfortable? And oftentimes there is, and we're able to do that just through some communication um, and through some strongly worded letters from the attorney general's office that tend to get the attention of businesses in a way that, you know, calls and emails from consumers just can't. So we mediate a lot of these um, and quite successfully, you know, we recover, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars for consumers every year um, just through that mediation process. Sometimes the conduct that we see um, and oftentimes is serious enough that it's not something that simply needs to be medi mediated. It's something that requires an enforcement action by this office. And so the Consumer Protection Act gives to this bureau the ability to bring civil enforcement actions against a business that violates the Consumer Protection Act and a civil enforcement action gives us the ability to ask for a financial penalty of up to $10,000 per violation. Also gives us the ability to ask the court for injunctive terms, which would prevent the business from acting in a similar way in the future. And in some cases, we're actually able to have the court you know, close businesses down. Um, if they've sufficiently violated the Consumer Protection Act, we can impose restrictions that prevent them from continuing to do business in the state of New Hampshire. We also have the ability to bring criminal violations of the Consumer Protection Act if we determine that the conduct is egregious enough. And depending on whether we bring a charge against an individual, um, say there's one bad actor in a business who violates the Consumer Protection Act, lying to consumers, deceiving consumers, stealing from consumers. Um, if it's against an individual, it's a misdemeanor level offense, which means they can go to jail for up to a year. Uh, we also have the ability to bring a felony level Consumer Protection Act violation case against the corporation or the entity itself, which carries with it um, a penalty of up to $100,000 fine, which is a very significant remedy for most businesses. So we receive these complaints, we evaluate them, we have attorneys, investigators who are um, sworn law enforcement officers. We have a financial analyst that's able to look through in you know, document intensive cases that's able to you know, analyze documents in order to give us a better picture of what's going on. Uh, we have a team of dedicated paralegals and support staff. And through this process, we regularly bring both civil and criminal enforcement actions for violations of New Hampshire's Consumer Protection Act. And you know, this has become more important, I think this year than ever before. I think the work of the Bureau is always important, but the pandemic has really given wave to you know, a whole new world of consumer protection violations that we weren't seeing before. Uh, and some of them are you know, just starting to happen right now you know, as, as we move towards a vaccine and the promise of you know, a vaccine being available to different people at different periods of times. Uh, it's really, it's created an opportunity for people to really take advantage of that situation. And it leads to what I'll explain to you is a classic violation of a classic example of unfair and deceptive conduct. Uh, so what we're seeing is people posting advertisements, people making representations, uh, people sending out mailers, 
um, that are advertising the ability to pay money to reserve your spot to get a vaccine or to pay money to, you know, cut the line to get a vaccine. We also see people that are advertising products, um, often nutrients, supplements, various different things that they advertise as being able to prevent COVID or to treat COVID. Um, those types of representations um, are simply false. And, you know, it's those types of representations saying to a consumer in commerce, I can sell you this product, it will have this effect, when in reality, the person selling the product has no reasonable basis to, to make that statement, um, or they create a, a representation that they have the ability to administer a vaccine, when in fact, th there's no ability to buy your way to a vaccine, there's no ability to save your spot in line. Um, and so through those sorts of fraudulent conduct, we do see people that are trying to take advantage of the pandemic. And I think I'd like to think that we've made a big difference in protecting consumers from falling victim to those types of, of scams and, and frauds throughout the course of the pandemic. So there, it does come with some um, exemptions. We're not able to look at everything. And, and the exemptions of certain conduct is specifically exempt from the Consumer Protection Act if it is the type of conduct that is regulated by certain other state agencies, those being the Bureau of in, uh, the Department of Insurance, the Department of Banking, the Bureau of Securities Regulation, who we just heard from, and the Public Utilities Commission. So if, if actors are engaging in unfair, deceptive acts or practices, and it's, a, let's say, a mortgaging company that's regulated by the banking department, the banking department has its own unfair, deceptive acts or practices statute. We wouldn't be able to take action on that. That's something the banking department would have to do. In addition to 358A, the Consumer Protection Act, we also enforce RSA 356, which we call the Antitrust Act. Uh, what it prohibits is monopolies, combinations, price fixing, those types of transactions that work to lessen competition and lessen consumer choice in the state of New Hampshire. And a, gr a great example of this, as you know, uh, Attorney Donovan said during his presentation, the Charitable Trust Division looks at hospital combinations for certain certain reasons that he articulated. The Antitrust Division of the Consumer Protection Bureau looks at them to determine whether or not they violate 356, which like the Consumer Protection Act has both civil and criminal penalties. So it's, it's a law enforcement statute that if two entities, like as you're aware, you know, hospitals are the, the hot ticket combination in the state right now. If two entities try to merge together, we review that transaction to determine whether if successful and if completed in the form that's currently proposed, that transaction will have the effect of reducing competition and reducing consumer choice in New Hampshire. And if it does, we have the ability to file a, a suit essentially asking the court to block that transaction, prevent it from happening. Um, also, we see this less now. Really what the antitrust work that's focused on right now is these mergers and combinations. Um, but we would also have the ability to look at price fixing schemes, um, agreements between different companies that they're going to set their prices sufficiently high so that it, while it appears consumers actually have choice and there's an open market, what they're doing is gradually driving prices up without consumers even knowing it based on agreements between two or more businesses um, so that they can each profit in turn. Uh, we currently are prosecuting along with almost every other state in the country, several suits against various generic prescription drug manufacturing companies in the throughout the country that were doing just this. Um, we're basically working with each other to make sure that the cost of prescription drugs um, for each of their companies was as high as possible and eliminating the ability for a free market to allow the better product to, to be the higher product and consumers to choose you know, between a generic product and a brand name product. That choice was essentially eliminated based on the lawsuits that we brought. Um, and so that's a really good example of you know, price fixing and how our bureau, in conjunction with all the other attorney general's office in this state, can um, review and bring a prosecutorial action if people violate the um, antitrust statute. And so the the context of working with other states is also very important. You know, I've talked about you know how we would bring 
Consumer Protection Act or antitrust violations on an individual basis, you know, New Hampshire, ver the state of New Hampshire versus an individual. Um, there's also much, much bigger consumer protection work being done throughout the country where all of or the majority of state's attorneys general's offices will pool together to take on bigger companies. Um, we've recently filed lawsuits against Google, um, lawsuits against Facebook. Uh, these are efforts where all the resources of the AG's office throughout the country have pooled together um, their resources from their consumer protection division in order to look at the practices of companies that you know are so big that no individual state would be able to, to look at them on their own and become a force to be reckoned with to try to protect not only New Hampshire's consumers, but consumers throughout the country from both consumer protection and antitrust violations. So a few other of the, the functions that this bureau undertakes, uh, we have a tobacco enforcement division. I won't get into the, the nitty gritty of this, but the, the long and short of it is that based on a settlement agreement with the major tobacco companies many, many years ago, uh, the state receives a substantial amount of money every year from tobacco companies. Uh, we work to enforce their participation in their obligations to um, provide money to the states that's supposed to be used to um, mitigate the impact that smoking and tobacco products has had um, on the public in general and all states that join this agreement. So we are um, working with various different manufacturers of tobacco products throughout the country to protect and make sure that New Hampshire receives the compensation that it is due under this agreement. Uh, which is, I believe, is over forty million dollars last year, and you know is around that much every year. Uh, uh, that's our tobacco enforcement unit. We also have an elder abuse and financial exploitation unit, which is something that I'm very proud of. Uh, that was the position that I held before I took the role of bureau chief here. It's a purely criminal unit that is 100% dedicated to the investigation um, and prosecution of those who take advantage of the elderly in the state of New Hampshire. And uh, Jeff Spill from the Bureau of Securities Regulation, I heard him talk briefly about um, some of the conduct that is investigated. And scams is a big part of it, but some of the other work that we do in really the majority of the work that we do in the elder exploitation world is people that are put in a position of trust, a fiduciary capacity like a trustee, a guardian, or a power of attorney for an elderly person and violate that trust in order to take advantage and steal from an elderly person, deprive them of their life savings. Um, we take those cases very, very seriously. And there are numerous people that are currently incarcerated at the state prison just for doing exactly that. Um, so we have one attorney and one victim advocate that are entirely dedicated to that work. And uh, so the Consumer Protection Act also, as you'll see in legislation that it will inevitably come forward this year. It also links up with various other statutes um, all throughout the New Hampshire RSAs uh, and specifically makes violation of various different statutes um, a violation of the Consumer Protection Act if it's consumer related. Um, a great example of this is the Bureau is responsible for registering and regulating all of the health clubs and all of the martial arts studios in the state of New Hampshire. The reason that it's necessary for consumer protection in this area is health clubs and martial arts studios operate on a model where people pay in advance for their services. So you can purchase you know, a year of a gym membership up front or a year's worth of personal training classes up front. Uh, but what happens if the gym then disappears six, month, six months into that you know, contract? Uh, we make sure that gyms that are offering prepaid services, martial arts studios that are offering prepaid services, they have to register with us, they have to disclose their prepaid liability to us, and we make sure that they have a bond in place that covers their refund liability in the event that the school closes. We have the ability to draw on that bond in order to get consumers their money back. There's also various other uh, things that they have to disclose to us for the purpose of consumer protection. Um, various um, requirements in their contract that make sure that they're fully disclosing to members, you know, all of their responsibilities, make sure that they're not taking advantage of people. Um, we regulate all the health clubs in the state and if they fail to register with us, it ties back and it's a, it's a violation of the Consumer Protection Act. So we would have the ability to bring all of those same remedies and penalties that I discussed earlier, either civil, civilly or criminally, depending on how serious the violation is. 
And, you know, I've, I've, so I've worked very quickly through, you know, the world of the types of stuff that we cover. Uh, i just give you a few examples of the types of consumer protection work that we generally see in this bureau, um, just to bring it home. And then I'm happy to take questions. You know, far and away, the, the top complaints that we get you know, through our hotline process and through our complaint process are car dealerships and contractors. Um, car dealers, especially used car dealerships, creates an enormous potential um, for the violation of consumer protection laws, specifically in representing used cars to be of a specific condition or quality uh, when in fact that's not true. You know, when you go and you buy a, new, a used car, you're really dependent to a large extent on the dealership being honest with you and disclosing, you know, has it been in prior accidents? What sort of condition is it in? How many miles does it have? Um, all those things need to be clearly and plainly disclosed and concealing that information from a consumer, lying to a consumer about the condition of a car, you know, it's, it's advertised as runs great, will pass inspection, consumer drives it off the lot and, you know, the thing breaks down on the way home and turns out it's nowhere near passing an inspection and nobody's looked at the thing. So the dealership saying, you know, runs great, will pass inspection, unless they've actually inspected it, they've actually looked at it and they can back up that representation, that would be a violation of New Hampshire's Consumer Protection Act as an unfair or deceptive statement that was made to the consumer. Contractors are, I think it's probably 50-50. I, I think we get just as many used car complaints as we get contractor complaints. And you know, contractors in New Hampshire don't need to be licensed. Uh, they're not regulated in any capacity other than through the Consumer Protection Bureau. And it just creates the potential for an enormous amount of taking money up front, either to buy materials or prepayments for labor to, to do some sort of a construction job. And then the person disappears with the money and the consumer never sees them again. And, you know, we have to toe the line between, you know, we cannot get involved in contract disputes. So a contract dispute specifically by law is, does not rise to the level of a Consumer Protection Act violation. There has to be something more. There has to be something more egregious about the conduct that would make it um, something that the Attorney General's office would enforce versus, you know, something that the parties would litigate between themselves in small claims court or in a civil court. Um, so we get a lot of complaints about quality of work. You know, somebody, you know, builds a deck and then they, a year later, they're having all sorts of problems with the deck because the contractor did subpar work. You know, that's potentially a, you know, a contract dispute. The person didn't do the work to the level that, you know, they were supposed to do. A consumer can take that individual to court. You have a situation where a person pays money for, say, $10,000 for the deck, the same deck, you know, so that the person can go out and buy materials. And then the person never shows up, never provides a consumer with any materials, um, never gives them any of their money back. That's a situation that we see all the time. And that is where we can be really effective because we are able to not only bring Consumer Protection Act violations, but we also have general criminal jurisdiction in this bureau and can bring felony theft charges as well as Consumer Protection Act violations against those individuals. And we're able to get court ordered restitution as well as significant punitive sanctions such as uh, jail time or fines if appropriate for contractors that are engaged in those sorts of unfair deceptive acts or practices. So I feel like I've spoken for a very long time. That's a very, very high level view of the work the Bureau does. I'm very happy to take any specific questions at this point if there are any. Well, that was excellent, Brandon. You really did, did cover all the, all the nooks and crannies and I really appreciate you uh, making that presentation. So we do have a couple of questions. We'll start with uh, Representative Petusik. Uh, good morning, sir. Good morning. Uh, my, my question is on uh, generic drugs. Now I've had an issue. Uh, I used to take a prescription medication, uh, which went generic. And then uh, because, well, Myelin and Teva are the two worst uh, generic drug manufacturers that A, they raise the price because there is only one generic manufacturer and they control what it is. Uh, is there any definition for a generic drug anywhere in the New Hampshire uh, regulations? 
So I'm not sure I understand your question. Is, is there a definition for a generic drug? I mean, a generic drug by definition is a non name. So when you create a drug, you know, you invent a new drug, the company that makes it has a certain period of exclusivity where they're the only ones that get to sell the drug because they came up with the formula. So they're given an opportunity to profit off their ingenuity for a certain period of time. And then once that period of time lapses, other companies can start make using their formula to create what's called generic versions of that drug. So it's any drug that is made that is not a name brand drug uh, would be a generic drug. But I, I'm not sure if that's the question you're asking me. Okay, part of the part of the question is uh, when when it goes generic, there might be one manufacturer. Uh, in my case, it's Myelin. And yeah, so, so hey, John, um, <laughs> the simple answer is just like any, any, anybody who has a patent, when you lose your patent, it's free for anybody to make it. It doesn't mean that anybody else is going to make it or copy it. It just means that they're free to do it. So, so in terms of the, I don't know where you're going with this, maybe you can, we can talk offline on this one, but, uh, okay. but in, in general, um, you know, the generic in when, it, when people think of a pharmaceutical is pretty much just think in terms of patents. When you're running your, when your patent runs out, anybody can copy what you did. Anybody can produce the product, whether they do it or not is another subject. Okay. Okay. Yeah, Teva right. and Mylan are subject to one of the, the current pending multi-state suits that has been brought by this office and attorney general's offices throughout the country. Thank you. I that would be under the monopoly. There, were, there was more of a terms of the monopoly issue, right? In the, it was price fixing. Yeah, price fixing. Exactly. Okay. Uh, Representative <laughs> Herbert is up next. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, nice uh, presentation. I, I, I was interested. Uh, it was interesting. But I, uh, two questions, if I may. Um, number one is uh, contractor uh, disputes uh, or, you know, frauds or whatever. If you're a plumber, you have to get a license. If you're an electrician, you have to get a license. I would assume that most contractors hire licensed professionals. Maybe some don't. And then you get some quality issues. Is there any... Uh, is there, would it be a good idea to have a general contractor's license or is there some way of, of so doing so as to best ensure uh, getting a quality job? I mean, somebody's always going to buy the cheapest stuff there and get exactly what they paid for. But there is no license, is there? Or is There is no, New Hampshire does not have any licensing requirement for contractors. So, is that unusual? Anybody so, can become a contractor simply by declaring themselves a contractor. So Representative Herbert, you are getting into policy here. And uh, so we, it's a little awkward to ask, uh, ask a department about a policy. Uh, this policy issue of, of licensure contractors has been in front of the Commerce Committee in the past. Mm. Uh, it's been a while since we've had it, um, but it has been in the past. Um, and, uh, and in every time it, it did not pass. Um, and I'll and I'll love to talk to you offline about uh, why why it didn't pass, uh, but because I I was in the room when it happened. So okay, but, uh, <laughs> but, but I would say that it is a policy issue, so it's awkward to ask him what the policy. Okay, is. So, uh, second question I don't think is a policy issue. Maybe it is, but uh, and that is a real simple one. Um, uh, you ran across a lot of responsibilities there. Do you have a manpower problem? <laughs> or could you use could you use another attorney or two? I guess I'm just a. Uh, I know it's it's touchy because we live in a you know an environment where it's very difficult to raise money uh, at times, and so that's an issue. But I'm I'm concerned also with the ability to provide the service at a level that I think my citizens, my constituents deserve. And if you're short a man or two or a woman or two, or uh, I, would be, I would be interested in knowing about that. Let me uh, answer it this way. Um, we are limited to the work we can do by the resources that we have. And right. we have, um, at this point, we have three lawyers that, including myself, that do the general consumer protection work. We have 
one full-time and one part-time lawyer that do all of the state's antitrust work. Uh, we have one lawyer doing tobacco. We have one lawyer doing elder abuse. Uh, we could, without question, be doing a lot more if we had additional resources. Just one minor technical thing. Is this something that we would hear from the Attorney General himself? In other words, if it's requested by him, uh, it's probably a better, he has a better chance of uh, getting that help than if uh, Brandon Garrod is, uh, even though he's being very honest, I can't wait for the AG I, to show up. <laughs> I would, I would, inter you know, it, I would think every time, every budget cycle we go through, uh, right. the AG's office will <laughs> always have no to the, the finance committee that uh, they could use, use more help. And I would say that I pretty much, that's an biannual event that does occur. And the AG is the one who does request and it is part of the of their, their budget. Um, I look forward but, to helping them. And for us, it's actually kind of unusual because different from all the other uh, departments that we regulate, which are self-funded, this is the only one that really is not self-funded. However, I would say that um, they've been doing a wonderful job with some of these uh, class, you know, national lawsuits and have been bringing in more revenue than ever before. Um, uh, but we wouldn't call it a revenue; we'd call it a fines or assessment. But but that um, you know they are they're doing better, and it's been it's been positive. But um, it is true that that unlike some states, so like for instance Vermont, the banking and, and insurance department is uh, is not uh, assessment run. It is actually part of the general fund. But so having said that, uh, thank you very much, Brandon. It was was great. And I've been doing. I don't see any more hands. Oh, Representative Bilo has has one more question. Yeah, um, uh, rental property owners, um, do you have oversight on um, uh, conditions of uh, a property that's being rented by an individual? So it depends. You know, we so this is this ties back to the definition of trader commerce. The Consumer Protection Act applies to those that are engaged in trader commerce in New Hampshire. So. You know, and to, to use an example here to answer your question, if you have a, a landlord whose business it is, is being a landlord, you know, owns several properties, yeah. uh, makes his living off being a landlord, and is in any way acting in an unfair or deceptive manner in the course of that business of renting properties, uh, yes, we would have the ability to investigate and potentially bring an enforcement action. If it's, you know, an individual that has a guest house and rents their guest house out, you know, just to make a little bit of side money, that's probably not considered trader commerce. And that's something that would have to be litigated, you know, individually by the parties. But we do get complaints against landlords routinely. We look at them. I mean, unfortunately, the most common complaint we get is disputes about security deposits. And that's not something that we can get involved in. You know, that's very specifically, you know, there's an agreement where, you know, person collects a security deposit, it will be returned if certain conditions are met. And, you know, there's a disagreement about whether those conditions were met or not. That's a classic example of, you know, really what they're debating is the contract and who violated the contract and who didn't. You know, that's something that would have to be resolved civilly. But for example, if a landlord who is engaged in trade or commerce um, posted an advertisement that represented that his apartments were of a sufficient quality um, or that had they had certain amenities that allured uh, lured people into signing lease agreements when in fact that was a lie you know they were actually of a lesser quality or they didn't have the amenities as advertised those would be consumer protection act violations that we could get involved in great thank you very much yeah, so uh, yeah, like any department that but they can't talk about any specific cases that are going on but when you uh, take what's happening in peterborough right now because it's near and dear the town two towns over from me in range that you I mean clearly if you're the landlord is pointing out that these are legitimate properties that you can rent, you know, and he's making that promise and then and not follow through. Um, clearly, that, that is a, a potential consumer protection violation. The only other thing I would want to mention, just so everybody get, has it in your head, is that the consumer protection is about uh, individuals. So, um, a uh, generally a corporation, you know, a corporate agreement you know, suing another corporation, that's that's we don't get involved in that. Even carryover in terms of banking insurance that we don't really, uh, we, we don't 
in terms of our consumer protections and their statutes and their, which uh, they, you know, in terms of the right of restitution that those departments have, is it really is about harming a an individual. If a, if a corporation has a contractual problem, they got to take that up uh, separately, but that would not involve our department and agencies involved in that. So uh, thank you very much, Brandon. This was great. Thank and appreciate it. Uh, and uh, so now being 11.25, so now I'm going to ask um, all the uh, lobbyists who would like to uh, introduce themselves to go ahead, raise your hands, and um, and then we'll we'll go through this list. Uh, I see there's already 24 attendees, so this could be pretty active. Um, I would say, please don't uh, spend too long. Just uh, introduce yourself. And uh, you know, talk about the you know who your who your employer is and what your issues are, uh, but be remember it's uh, it's between what is, it, what is the famous line that you are now between us and our lunch, so uh, please be a model of brevity. Okay, so the this list uh, oh, I thought it was going to be alphabetical, so I guess it was whoever could click it the fastest, which turns out to be Henry Veyu. So I'm going to promote you to a panelist, Henry, and. You can then just unmute yourself and uh, go ahead and speak. Perfect. Hi, great. Uh, thank you. Um, good, uh, good morning, everyone. It's still morning. Um, my name is Henry Veyu. I'm with uh, the lobbying firm of Sheehan Finney Capital Group. Um, we, our firm represents a variety of clients. Um, the clients that uh, you'll see me uh, before your committee uh, include uh, the New Hampshire Lodging and Restaurant Association, uh, and we're there typically uh, for liquor issues, uh, menu labeling, uh, those kinds of things. Uh, we all, I also represent uh, the American Council of Life Insurers, and uh, they've got life insurance uh, products, annuities, uh, long-term care insurance, uh, disability uh, insurance uh, products. Uh, so obviously with the uh, insurance aspect of your committee, I'm, I'm here before uh, those issues. Um, also represent the Entertainment Software Association. They are an association of video game manufacturers. Um, an issue that's come up over the past several years uh, is the right to repair. Uh, and I believe there's a, another bill in this session. Um, we also represent uh, the Hospital Corporation of America. Uh, that's Portsmouth Hospital, Parkland Hospital, and Frisbee Hospital. Uh, they are the only uh, for-profit uh, hospital in the state of New Hampshire. Um, issues that come before your committee uh, that, that impact them uh, deal with things like hospital mergers uh, and the, um, uh, the Attorney General's review of those kinds of uh, mergers. Um, also represent uh, LKQ. They are an aftermarket's auto part uh, manufacturer, and uh, there's often uh, auto parts legislation that comes before the committee. Um, so those are the clients that you'll see me come before your committee on. And it was uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to introduce myself. Okay, great. Thank you, Henry. All right, next up is Glenn Perlow. All right, you're, you're in, you just have to unmute yourself, Glenn. I have done so. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Chairman Hunt. Um, nice to see the returning members of the committee and welcome to new members of the committee. Uh, my name is Glenn Perlow. I am Vice President and Chief Compliance Officer at Jordan Park Trust Company in Hampton. Uh, those who have uh, seen me testify before will know we were a Prospecta trust company and we were recently acquired by uh, a larger uh, investment advisor out of San Francisco and New York, um, which I hope is reflective of the success of what we've uh, been at since, uh, well, since uh, Chairman Hunt uh, has worked on trust modernization and our efforts to build it so they will come. Uh, I just want to mention uh, briefly, I'm also president of the New Hampshire Trust Council, if I didn't say that. Um, and uh, in the past, we've been known for epically long legislation. And um, as uh, Commissioner Little mentioned yesterday, 
Uh, there is reason not to do that this term especially, but also um, I'm trying to reflect on that and present the committee with more manageable bites. So I will just briefly mention uh, LSR 2021-0760, uh, which I don't think has uh, uh, come out in bill language yet, um, is blissfully two pages long. Uh, <laughs> we hope and think non-controversial. Uh, and I very much look forward to, um, to uh, working with the committee and uh, telling you more about uh, our industry. Thanks very much. All right, thank you, Glenn. Uh, next up is Kate Fry. Okay, Kate, you're on. Just uh, don't forget to unmute yourself. Hello, sorry. Uh, I got kicked off just as I was, uh, you called my name. So, it's law, huh? <laughs> <laughs> uh, my name is Kate Fry. I'm with A New Futures, which is a nonprofit, nonpartisan uh, organization work that works on health and wellness issues, our areas of policy that we work on include um, substance use disorder, healthcare, access to treatment, early childhood and children's behavioral health. My role as a lobbyist, my bucket area really includes alcohol and other drugs. So you will see me a lot with uh, liquor bills and we work closely with um, the, the commission and other partners. I have a colleague on the phone uh, as well too who will introduce herself, herself uh, who works on healthcare issues. And thank you and I hope you have a very good year, unique year this ahead of us this year. Good to see you all. Good to see you, thank you. Okay, next up is Ellen Scarponi. So Ellen, yeah, oh, Ellen, all you have to do is, uh, you've been promoted, all you have to do is unmute yourself. I Here I am, I hope. Great, yes, hi. Hi, there, good morning. Uh, almost afternoon. It's good to actually see all of you. I'm Ellen Scarponi and I represent Consolidated Communications. We are the phoenix that rose from the old New England telephone, 9X, Verizon, Fairpoint, and now we are consolidated. We provide telephone, broadband, and business communications uh, with over 46,000 fiber route miles in 23 states. In New Hampshire specifically, we provide service to over 244 communities. Of note and things that we will bring be before your committee for is that since the passage of the municipal bonding, broadband bonding legislation, which is RSA 333G, as well as the CARES Act grants, we're working to partner with over 50 municipalities right now to expand and build high-speed fiber broadband networks, including the rural communities of Ringe, <laughs> Mr. Chairman, uh, Chesterfield, Dublin, Danbury, Mason, Errol, Springfield, and a host of others. Um, I've been in telecom for over 40 years. During my career, I've also owned and operated a theatrical resort in Maine, was briefly with Merrill Lynch in Burlington, Vermont, was with East Atlantic Advertising in Manchester and owned a dream dinner uh, meal prep franchise in Bedford. And the reason I tell you that is that I do have a, a varied background. Um, please, please let me know if you have any questions about what we do at Consolidated and or if you have any constituent concerns. I live in Canterbury and I look forward to working with all of you. Thanks. Great, thank you, Ellen. Okay, next we have Susan Pichel. Oops. Uh, you get, all right, I'm promoting you now, Susan, and just remember to unmute yourself. Good morning. Thanks, thanks, um, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I think I'm unmuted. Yes, you are. You're on. Sorry, okay. I should, I should read. Um, there you are. <laughs> video on too. Yep, you're all. Um, hi, I work with, at the DuPont Group. Um, there are several of us that, who you'll see in your committee this session. Uh, Jim Monahan, Kate Horgan, Tristan Craig, myself. And we represent a number of healthcare um, organizations. We work with New Futures, with Kate Fry. We work with a number of substance use disorder and treatment recovery providers. 
We work with Solution Health, which is the parent system for Elliott Hospital and Southern New Hampshire Medical Center, the largest healthcare system in the state. We work with the 10, 10 community mental health centers. We work with Bi-State um, uh, Primary Care, which is the community health centers and the FQHCs, the New Hampshire Nurse Practitioners, the New Hampshire Dental the Hygienist Association, the county nursing homes. Um, and then on the technology side, we work with Deloitte and Apple. So um, welcome back returning members and I'll, I'm looking forward to meeting uh, new members as well. Thank you. Great, thank you. All right, next is gonna be Holly Stevens and I'm promoting you, Holly. And just for, don't forget to unmute yourself. Hello. Oh, I've got a nice halo in the back. Um, thank you, uh, Chairman Hunt, for uh, giving us this opportunity to introduce ourselves to members of uh, the Commerce Committee. Um, Holly Stevens, I work with Kate Fry at New Futures. Um, I'm going to spare you the uh, giving you the description of uh, what New Futures is and does again. Um, but as Kate mentioned, I do the health policy um, aspect. Um, when I originally took the position at New Futures, I thought I was going to be downstairs in health and human services uh, most of the time. And as uh, luck would have it, um, I actually find myself upstairs in commerce um, probably about 90% of the time that um, I'm over at the uh, house in the LOP, mainly because I'm working on a lot of uh, health insurance issues and other um, health issues that come before your committee. Um, unlike a lot of the other lobbyists, um, Kate and I don't really have any clients per se. Um, we are funded to um, work on behalf of the, the residents of the state of New Hampshire. So we are more than happy to provide any and all information um, that you may need. Um, you can reach out to us um, uh, via email and or, uh, phone. Um, and it's nice to see the returning members, and I, like many others, am looking forward to uh, meeting the new members on the committee as well. And thank you again, Chairman Hunt. Okay, thank you. Uh, next is Jody Grimos, and I'm promoting you, Jody. And don't forget to unmute yourself. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, hi, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. It's good to see all of you. I don't actually think I can start my video too. There we go. Yep, there we go. Okay. Um, it is good to see all of you and, and welcome to the new members of the committee. Um, I am part of a small firm. Uh, my firm is myself and my colleague, Adam Schmidt. Um, we've been representing clients at the State House for uh, both of us now over 20 years or so. Um, we represent a wide variety of clients. We have some of the clients you may see us in front of your committee for. Um, we have the New Hampshire Association of Realtors. We work with the uh, insurance and financial advisors. Um, we work with CVS Health. Um, so if you have questions or information needed from CVS, please let us know. The New Hampshire Beverage Association, which are the non-alcoholic, um, the Coca-Colas and the Pepsi providers here in the state, um, as well as others. So. We see ourselves as facilitators. We want to provide you the information you need, um, facts, research, data, whatever we can do. Uh, we're just here to be a resource and, and look forward to working with you all. I will follow up with a, um, an email introduction with that list all of our clients. So that way um, you have our contact information, a little bit about us and um, ways to get in touch with us if you need. So again, thank you all. It's good to see you all. I can't wait till we get to all see each other in person again and um, look forward to working with you. <laughs> And nice seeing you too, Jody. Okay, next up is Nancy Vaughn. And I'm promoting you, Nancy. And just don't forget to... You there? Nancy? Yes, good right. morning right. still. <laughs> Sorry, I also looked like I was being thrown off for a moment there. But okay. um, so thank you very much, Chairman Hunt, um, members of the Commerce Committee for um, this opportunity to introduce myself. Um, uh, again, I'm Nancy Vaughn. Um, I am Government Relations Director for the American Heart Association, which I um, am a full-time staff member for. Um, and uh, in addition to funding research and uh, creating education 
additional materials for um, individuals to prevent and treat heart disease and stroke. Um, we also do advocate um, uh, for public policies really focused mostly on patients and individuals that we want to have avoid developing risk factors which lead to heart disease and stroke. Um, the, um, what we really do, what we basically do is um, with, with the research that's out there, um, we create evidence-based um, public policies um, and we will come before you um, should there be policies in front of you um, regarding issues like um, access to health care, access to health insurance, um, also the, the quality, affordability of, of all of that care. Um, we also um, will come before you if uh, tobacco issues, mainly regarding um, retailers, I believe, um, but also that are really about consumer protections. Our main concern around tobacco control is really making sure that um, uh, young people, um, youth and young adults don't get started um, with using tobacco products. Um, and again, I, I want to be a resource to this committee. So um, if there are any issues that you're interested in learning more about regarding heart disease and stroke, I hope that you'll consider me a resource to you. And I look forward to this coming session and hope things go smoothly for all of you. Um, and uh, again, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, and coincidentally, another related industry, Mike Rollo, another former state rep who, uh, you, uh, you're ready to go, Mike? Uh, Sorry, I got bounced. I, like everyone else, it looks like I'm getting bounced out, but I'm here. So okay. thank you, Mr. Chairman. I hope, I'm guessing you can hear me looking at your facial expression. Yes, I can so, hear you. Yes, yes. Anyway, so I'm, I'm Mike Rollo. I'm the uh, Government Relations Director for the American Cancer Society Cancer Action Network, uh, which is a mouthful, so we usually just say ACS CAN. Uh, we are the nonprofit, uh, nonpartisan advocacy affiliate of the American Cancer Society that uh, supports evidence-based uh, uh, policy and legislative solutions designed to eliminate um, cancer as a major health burden uh, in this country. And I'm looking forward to um, working with all of you and seeing you, although I don't think my picture is not coming up. So I put a tie on for nothing, Mr. Chairman. You can't right. see me. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> oh, well. But thank you very much for the opportunity. I'm looking forward okay. to seeing you all. Right. Okay. Uh, next up is Katie Cole. My phone, I put it on mute. Why the muting is not working? Oh, I'll hang up on him. Okay. Go ahead, Katie. <laughs> I guess this, we're bumping people off, unfortunately. I don't know. I'll have to, um, why that's happening. Hi, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Hi. Okay. Sorry about that. Uh, my name is Katie Cole, um, and I am the public policy manager for the Freedom Health Plan um, that was recently acquired by United Health Group. Um, we have about 40,000 members um, in New Hampshire, and you primarily will see me working on issues related to health care and health insurance and um, issues facing the small group market. Um, I'll keep it short and sweet for today, but I'm looking forward to working, hello, uh, working yeah. with all of you this session, um, albeit remotely, um, and it's good to see everybody. Great. Well, thank you. And also on the health insurance route, I'm now uh, Heidi Kroll. And so we'll see Heidi, she'll get bumped off and you got to turn it back on. <laughs> and, can you hear me, Mr. Chairman? Yes, I can. Okay, great, thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, it's nice to see all of you, um, uh, familiar faces as well as folks who are new to the committee. Uh, my name is Heidi Kroll. I work at Gallagher, Callahan and Gartrell and um, I represent uh, America's Health Insurance Plans um, or otherwise known as AHIP, which is the um, National Trade Association for the Health Insurance Carriers um, here in New Hampshire. Um, our members include uh, Anthem, uh, Harvard Pilgrim, Cigna, um, and the three um, Medicaid uh, care organizations as well. Um, hopefully I haven't forgotten anybody. Um, at any rate, we, uh, I work you know, closely with, with your committee on a variety of um, health insurance bills and healthcare bills that come before you. Um, as other folks have said, um, 
would certainly um, welcome the opportunity to give you any information you may need. Um, always want to be a resource uh, for you and, um, uh, you know, just look forward to working with you. And um, I know you're going to be working remotely initially, uh, but hopefully we get back in person at some time soon. Um, but feel free to call me or email me at any time. Um, if I don't have answers for you uh, right away, I will certainly work um, to get them, uh, to get you answers as quickly as possible. So thank you very much. Thank you. All right, next is Gina Powers. And I'm promoting you, Gina. So you're now in the panelist list. Oh, there we go. Sorry there, about that. There we go. Perfect. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Gina Powers with Rath Young and Pignatelli um, here in Concord, or not here. I'm not in Concord, in Concord, New Hampshire. Um, we represent a whole multitude of clients, um, and we'll be uh, coming before you uh, for several different of them, several different industries, um, American Express, Anthem Insurance, Amazon, Comcast, Credit Unions, uh, the New Hampshire Grocers Association, um, the United States Travel Insurance Association, and Reynolds American. I work with four other gentlemen who you'll see uh, periodically, Dave Collins, Rich Parsons, Kyle Baker, and Bobby Collins, no, um, no relation. And um, I look forward to working with all of you um, and please use us as a resource, uh, email us or, or call us and we'll be happy to get you any information that you might need. Great, thank you, Gina. Uh, next up is Curtis Berry. Okay. Good morning. There you are. Great. Good morning, Curtis. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, I am Curtis Barry, uh, and wanted to introduce a few of the clients that I represent before the committee on a regular basis. Um, starting with the PCMA, it's a trade association of the Pharmacy Benefit Management Association. Um, pharmacy benefit managers are often misunderstood in their role in uh, reimbursement for the prescription drugs. Uh, happy to provide uh, information and a briefing on that at the, the committee's uh, discretion uh, at convenience. Uh, also the New Hampshire Optometric Association, which represents over 170 doctors of optometry Oops. Eye healthcare in the state. Uh, the New Hampshire Retail Association, which represents retailers of all shapes and sizes, including many of the nationally based retailers who operate in the state. But over 90% of their membership includes New Hampshire based Main Street type stores, and, and they're interested in a wide variety of interest uh, in issues that come before the committee. Uh, the New Hampshire Retail Lumber Association, which is uh, our building material suppliers throughout the state. Uh, independently owned, many of them. Uh, the Cigar Association of New Hampshire, which is a coalition of premium retail cigar shops, uh, hope to have a hearing very early on a, on a bill that they have interest in uh, coming before the committee. Uh, and then lastly, Microsoft Corporation occasionally has some interest in policy matters. Uh, that, and I uh, occasionally present the Microsoft point of view on, on some of those issues. Uh, hopefully you received an email from me last week with a little bit more detail on, on a lot of these and my contact information and looking forward to uh, getting to work. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right, thank you, Curtis, good job. All right, next up is uh, Ryan Hale and I'm promoting you now, Ryan. And my understanding is you, I don't know, you're getting thrown out or you're now a panelist, so. I am here. Can you hear me? Here go look at oh look at that fancy background. Oh, no, you know, <laughs> trying to impress. <laughs> it looks like. <laughs> well, welcome everyone. It's great to see uh, returning members, and welcome um, to the new members of the committee. It's uh, it's great to virtually see everyone. I look forward to the day where we can be doing this in person again. Um, to just give you a quick background, this is I think my ninth session of uh, lobbying. Um, I've spent the last three years with the Bankers Association. Prior to that, I was with the um, Automobile Dealers Association. So between the two, I've spent a lot of time in front of this committee. Um, 
as the Commissioner Little said yesterday, many of the banking bills uh, come before this committee. Um, what you'll see is banking is a very uh, complex uh, industry. It's a uh, heavily regulated, and for the most part, we try to maintain a level playing field between the um, the, the state. Uh, uh, state laws and federal laws um, and really maintaining uh, what's on this parity. Um, I sent the committee just uh, some background earlier this morning. Um, please feel free to reach out. Uh, it does include my contact information as well as Christy Merrill, uh, president of our association who may be on the call right now. And uh, um, uh, if she is, I think she has some uh, comments she'd like to make. But uh, it gives a little bit of a background of banking, um, how it's regulated, our priority issues. And I think really important right now is how the industry has responded to COVID, helping their communities um, get through this very difficult economic time. Um, I, I would be happy at any point um, if any of, especially the new members um, and existing members, if anyone's interested um, in scheduling a time to meet to really do a deeper dive into the industry um, and, and how it's regulated at the state and federal level. Um, and uh, again, I look forward to uh, the day where we get to do this in person and get to meet in person all the new members. Um, and uh, that's all I have for now. Thank you, Ripley. All right. Good job. All right. Next up is Scott Shire. I'm promoting now, Scott. And while I'm promoting you, Scott, uh, uh, Representative Terry wants to know why he can't get Ling Ling beer. <laughs> so not that you have to. Okay. Well, answer that actually, question. Great, great actually, question. And, actually, and, that, and, excuse me. It, actually, yeah. that is a very specific okay. question with, re, very, with respect to a particular brand. But it goes, to, it's, it goes to the broader question as a new representative of how it is determined that a producer can obtain permission to market in the state of New Hampshire. So mm -hmm. thank you. Yeah, well, let me, let me address that real quickly, and we can always have an offline discussion later, but basically, um, it's the decision of the supplier, or in this case, the brewer, um, to come to the state, whether they want to, they would have to get uh, the appropriate license to bring their product into the state, and then as um, Chairman Malika alluded to earlier, to go through the three-tier system, they would work with a wholesaler partner in the middle tier, and then bring it to retail. Um, obviously, in the last few years, as you know, they've chosen to, to move into uh, the state south of our border, the great state of Massachusetts, but they have not decided to come here for a variety of reasons, um, which I do not know specifically what those reasons are. But I know we do get a lot of requests like that for particular products. People have a great uh, deal of pride of origin. Um, as somebody who spent several years of my life living in Philadelphia, I come to appreciate Yingling as well. Um, uh, and every once in a while, I will go across the border and, and grab some and bring it home. So, um, but happy to, happy to chat about um, those specific circumstances or beer in general later. But before I, I do that, um, good morning. I know that lunch is coming up. Thank you, Chairman Hunt. Uh, and congratulations to all the members of the committee on your election and assignment to this dynamic committee. And thanks for allowing me to introduce myself today. Um, I'm Scott Shire. I've worked in the beer industry for the last 18 years in a variety of roles at both brewers and distributors. Um, and I've been here in New Hampshire for about eight years. And prior to that, I worked um, in a variety of commercial development roles for a large brewer down in Latin America. Um, but since coming back here, uh, to New Hampshire with my family. I've been the director of the New Hampshire Beer Distributors Association. I'm an employee of that association and I registered to lobby on, on their behalf um, and do a variety of commercial and economic development uh, matters for them as well as industry affairs, working with our brewer and retailer partners, both in the on and the off premise um, as, as well as government relations. So. Um, I'm at your service to provide any feedback or consult with you on any beverage alcohol policy that might come up um, to talk about any consumer issues or commercial matters with regard to constituents either. Oops. And um, can you hear me okay? Yeah, you're right. You just a little, little burp there. I have, I've got uh, home, should, 
crappy uh, internet at home like many people in New Hampshire. So I'm looking forward to broadband expansion too. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, I, I live in Durham, uh, New Hampshire right now with my wife and, and two kids in school and, uh, and serve on a variety of nonprofit boards in the state like New Hampshire the Beautiful, uh, New Hampshire Community Seafood and Brew New Hampshire. And uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to working with you um, as needed. Uh, and thanks again for your time today. Um, that's all I've got. Great. Thank you, Scott. That was great. Thanks. Uh, uh, Representative Terry, you can always uh, use the direct shipping law, my, my direct shipping law. You can have beer delivered to your house. <laughs> Otherwise, yes, you'll have to venture south. <laughs> okay, next is Paula Minahan from the Hospital Association. Good morning, Paula. Good morning. Everyone, sorry about that. Hopefully you can hear me. Um, yep, we can. And welcome back to um, all the members and welcome to the new members that have joined um, this, like someone said, a very dynamic committee. It's a, it's a great committee. And um, the Hospital Association is, um, comes in front of the committee quite often and primarily focused on health insurance, um, healthcare issues. Um, so we are there quite often. Um, my colleague, Nick Corona, actually um, is on as well, and hopefully he will get asked to just introduce himself real quick. He is actually more present um, in your committee than I, because I spend time in other committees as well. I am the, um, the, the Senior Vice President of State Government Relations for the Hospital Association and have been here almost 19, or have been here 19 years. Um, and we want to be a resource for you. I encourage our member, our hospital members who are all, um, all the hospitals in New Hampshire are part of the hospital association. Um, they do, as Henry said, and others, they have individual lobbyists sometimes, but we, we lobby for all of them. And um, we encourage our hospitals to reach out to their legislators. And I know a lot of you have attended legislative breakfasts in the past. This year, I think they will be done virtually um, and we will be working with our members to make sure that they do hopefully set that up. Um, but in the meantime, we are a resource. And again, you will see Nick at some point, he will um, get called on so you can at least see his nice face. Um, and then um, you can also reach out to us at any time if you have any questions about our hospitals. So thank you. And I look forward to getting to work. Great, thank you, Paula. Uh, next is Dan Bennett from the Auto Dealers. All right, Dan, you're on. Hopefully, you're on. Oh, you're there? Yes, are you there, Mr. Chairman? Oh, there you go. Good. Oh, look, you've got a fancy background too. Okay. <laughs> all right. Uh, good morning, and uh, thank you for the opportunity. Congratulations to all of you on your selection to the Commerce Committee. Um, I will be brief. My name is Dan Bennett. I'm with the New Hampshire Auto Dealers Association. Um, I'm the Vice President of our Government Relations. So NHADA is a trade association representing the motor vehicle industry. Uh, we have over 500 members. We are car, truck, snowmobile, ATV, construction, farm equipment, body shops. Um, pretty much if it's got an engine and wheels or tracks, we'll take it. Um, and we are both franchised and independent members. And we're very proud of the fact that uh, we actually represent more independent members than um, franchise folks. So um, we employ about 14,000 citizens in the state of New Hampshire. Uh, we make up about 24% of the retail sales uh, statewide. We're led by uh, our president, Peter McNamara, and we have an association staff of about 30 employees. Uh, we're located right on the Bow Concord line. Short of the Liquor Commission, I think we are regulated by just about every uh, regulatory agency in the state of New Hampshire. Uh, I don't need to go through the uh, the alphabet soup of acronyms, but mostly where we're in front of the Commerce Committee is for banking department and insurance department issues. So uh, that's where you see us. Shortly, uh, I will email you all a fact sheet about NHADA that has contact information and some statistics 
Um, but a few of the things that I just want to point out very briefly are uh, we work on roadway safety issues with the Department of Safety and DMV. Um, we also, workforce is a critical issue for us. Uh, we do a tremendous amount of workforce issues with uh, over 25 high schools and community colleges um, for both front end and back end jobs uh, in our industry, uh, whether it's sales and finance or the service department. Um, and we're very proud of over the past few years, we've given away over $400,000 in scholarships to students to get their careers and education started, uh, be it to pay for community colleges or tools um, in the service department. So workforce, again, a, a critical issue um, for us in our industry. Um, and then lastly, what I'd like to point out, um, and there'll be some contact and some information on the handout that I'll send to you, is our AutoCAP program. And AutoCAP is the Automotive Consumer Action Panel. It's a panel that we run uh, to help uh, consumer disputes. Uh, it'll be very helpful for your constituents. Uh, the Attorney General's Office, as Brandon mentioned earlier today, I know they refer about 200 calls to us that most often it's a misunderstanding. Uh, the sales manager didn't know what uh, a salesman told a customer or the customer didn't know what tires for life really meant. So just by engaging them in communication, we find that we can resolve a number of disputes. Um, if the consumer's not happy, they still have the ability to go to small claims court through the court system. The, the, the member, the dealer, the decision of this uh, independent arbitration panel, it's binding on them. And if they don't follow it, we have and we can and we, we will throw them out of our association. So we take it very, very seriously. Um, I believe the auto cap will be a great resource for you if you do have a constituent and consumer complaint. So um, I'll kind of don't want to stand any further between you and lunch. Um, I'll end it there. But just to mention that we look forward to working with you. If there's anything that we can assist on, please do not hesitate to reach out to us. And we hope to see you soon in person. Great. Thank you, Dan. That was excellent. All right. Next up is uh, Kathy Corey. I am now promoting you, Kathy. We're, we're down to about eight names left here. We're getting there. Are you there, Kathy? I can hear footprints. I hear people walking. <laughs> Are you there? How's that? Good afternoon. Okay, yeah, we got you. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry about that. Technology. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, and Happy New Year. It's nice to see all of you, although virtual. Um, Kathy Fox, I'm with the Bernstein Shore Group. Uh, we have a variety of clients, but most particular clients that are interested in your committee are Martinetti Companies of Northern New England, um, distributors of fine wine and spirits, and they are located in the beautiful Mill Yard in Manchester. We also work with Uber Technology, which I'm sure you're familiar with there vehicles for hire or ride share, and uh, also their food delivery known as Uber Eats. Um, we have, again, a variety of other clients that uh, are interested in commerce, but those are the two primary. Um, look, lunchtime is here. I thank you for this opportunity. I look forward to seeing each and every one of you in person, hopefully soon. Uh, and I wish you all the best this session. Thank you very much. Great, thank you very much. Uh, next up is Bruce Berkey. And you're on, Bruce. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. It's uh, my pleasure to, to be with you here the, this afternoon. Um, my name is Bruce Berkey. Uh, I'm with Sheehan Finney Capital Group, and you heard from uh, my partner, Henry Bayou, uh, a little bit earlier today. And uh, we have a variety of, of clients that are, uh, are very interested in issues that come before the House Commerce Committee. And uh, they include Equifax on uh, privacy and, and issues of that nature. The National Federation of Independent Business, they are a small business group of over a thousand members here in New Hampshire, um, dealing with you know, business issues and regulatory issues. Uh, Delta Dental is a, a regulated entity by the state of New Hampshire as, a, as an insurance uh, carrier. 
the chain drug stores here in New Hampshire uh, are a client of ours, and also Ski New Hampshire. Uh, Ski New Hampshire is, is uh, uh, active in front of several committees, and, and uh, you know they're having a, a challenging year, but uh, things are going pretty well with the way that the uh, uh, guidance, the visiting guidance, has been structured uh, through the state. So. With that, I uh, wish you a, a good legislative session and, and look forward to uh, seeing you either uh, virtually or in person soon. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Bruce. All right. Next up is Simon. Thompson. All right. Simon, you're on. Good morning, uh, Chairman Hunt and uh, members of the House Commerce Committee. Uh, the, the, the timing is ironic. I, too, am with uh, she and Finney Capital Group and, and work with Bruce Berkey and Henry Bayou, as well as, as a few others uh, in, our, in our shop. Uh, this afternoon, I'll just mention a couple of key clients that I specifically work on a, a majority of the time, and then uh, let you folks move on. Uh, to begin with, uh, Anheuser-Busch is one of our clients. As many of you know, there is a brewery, Anheuser-Busch has a brewery in the town of Merrimack. Just this past year, 2020, they celebrated their 50th anniversary uh, brewing uh, the most popular beer in the world. So we will uh, come before your committee on occasion. Uh, and as well as another client in the liquor uh, realm, as well as tobacco and others, is the New England Convenience Store and Energy Marketers Association, Nexima. Talk about a mouthful. Uh, they are the trade association that represents the convenience stores, as well as the businesses that deliver the fuel to those convenience stores. So uh, we will be coming before your committee on a whole host of issues with regard to uh, convenience stores. And then two more, uh, one in the insurance uh, realm, uh, PIA, Professional Insurance Agents of New Hampshire. They, they're the Independent Insurance Agent Owners Association. Uh, they come before your committee uh, on a fair, fairly regular basis. And a kind of along the lines of security, uh, telecommunications, uh, Verizon Wireless, uh, uh, along with Bruce uh, Berkey, uh, I represent Verizon Wireless as well. So you'll, you'll on occasion see us on behalf of that client. Um, look forward to working with you all in 2021 and I will uh, sign off. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, no, okay, so Sabrina Dunlap. I am now promoting you up. Okay. Hopefully. Hi, everybody. Hi. Uh, hi. Uh, I'm Sabrina Dunlap. I am the Director of Government Relations at Anthem. Uh, many of you might know Paula Rogers, who was in this role for many years, and Paula is still, thankfully, around, still involved with Anthem, and um, working with me as well. So you will probably see Paula uh, as well this session, which is great. Um, and anyway, just looking forward to working with you all. Thanks so much. Okay, thank you. Uh, Nick Carano. Uh, okay, Nick, you're on. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, just Paula, I'm, I'm with the New Hampshire Hospital Association. Um, Paula Minahan did a good job summarizing what we do. Specifically, I'm the Director of Financial Policy and Reimbursement. So as that pertains to um, our member hospitals, that's really why I spend a lot of time in the Commerce Committee. So I look forward to the session this year. Thanks, everybody. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I guess uh, my editorialization is that um, often when it comes to insurance reimbursements, you're dealing with hospitals and... So hence why the hospitals are visiting us. And also that merger, the, the issue of mergers that comes to us. Okay, so uh, I just, I, I just, <laughs> while I'm talking, I just promoted somebody. <laughs> uh, was it you, Liz? Beth, did I just promote you? Can you hear me? Yes, there yeah, you go. I think it there you are. There you are. <laughs> Good afternoon, Chairman Hunt, members of the committee. My name is Beth Sargent. I too work for Sheehan Finney Capital Group. The reason I would be before your committee would be that I represent the New Hampshire Pharmacist Association and also the New Hampshire Society of Health System Pharmacists uh, who are pharmacists in hospitals. I also represent the New Hampshire Funeral Directors Association 
and the New Hampshire Academy of Audiology. Um, and those are audiologists. Um, on a side note, um, clients I represent who are mo not usually before your committee, uh, the New Hampshire Association of Chiefs of Police and the New Hampshire Sheriff's Association. Once in a great while, we have something before you. So I look forward to uh, working with you. And if we can be assistants, we're happy to be so. Thank you. Okay, thank, great. thank you. Um, so now I have four more attendees, but they didn't raise your hand. So I don't know, uh, Jim Monahan or, or Jamie. Okay. Right now, now, so you, if you, you, yeah, all right. So I got Lindsay has raised her hand. Okay, perfect. Where's George, Lindsay? Hello, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for having me. George wasn't able to come, but I'm sure you'll be hearing from him. It's nice to see so many familiar faces and so many new faces. My name is Lindsay Nato. I'm a Concord native. I work at the law firm Orin Reno, just down the street from the state house. Um, as mentioned, I work with George Russos, who you will probably get to know if you don't know already. Uh, we primarily appear before House Commerce for insurance clients, and that runs the line from property and casualty insurance, life insurance, to health insurance. So, for example, we represent the New Hampshire Association of Domestic Insurance Companies, the National Trade, the American Property Casualty Insurance Association, and we also, also represent Cigna, um, the healthcare company. So we look forward to working with you and we're here to be a resource. So if there's anything we can help with, please don't hesitate to let us know. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. All right, Jim Monahan. All right. You're on, Jim. We're getting down there. Uh, great, Chairman Hunt, thank you. Uh, I'll just be brief because Susan Paschel from our office at the DuPont Group ran through a number of our clients. I just wanted to um, put a name with a face um, and um, um, I'm looking forward to spending some virtual time with the Commerce Committee this session. So, thank you. All right, good, thank you. All right, so I have two other names, but you guys, Jamie and Teresa, you didn't raise your hand. So I assume you didn't really feel need to share and introduce yourselves, which is fine. So otherwise to the rest of the committee, that is it. Uh, you can need to say, um, I wish I could say, well, that's, that's all the lobbyists, but there are a lot more out there that, that do uh, come in front of the committee. Um, sometimes our exec sessions, it, it, uh, it's amazing how many people we can pack into the room uh, from all the different industries and a variety of things that we do. So um, uh, with that, um, I thank you all very much. And uh, feel free to call me if you have any you know, suggestions or comments or how this is working or what we can do. Um, I, I'm, you know, this is a new experience for, for me, for sure. And uh, so we're trying to try our best. Um, if I do, uh, if get permission to schedule bills, um, you will get notification from, from Heather, usually sends out the notification and then of course the calendar. So uh, for your new members, I want I, I cannot emphasize enough that uh, Thursday night, um, they put out the calendar and you, you definitely want to read it, see who's in there, uh, see what's going on in other committees. Um, and they also have a Senate calendar, separate calendar, if you want to track bills that are going on in the Senate and not screw up like I did and forget it, not know that Senate Commerce was meeting with Monday where I should have been tuning in to watch. Uh, but nothing else, you can get everything now and you can see this all over again uh, on, on YouTube. And so, uh, which is a, a, a amazing phenomenon that I guess that was one of the positives of from this COVID is that we now have this technology um, to, to record all these these uh, these meetings. So uh, feel free to go back and revisit. Uh, there's a lot of stuff we got we covered today and a lot of people. Um, and uh, so you got a lot to think about over the weekend. Otherwise, uh, have a good uh, Martha Luther King weekend and uh, and we'll hopefully see you all next week or the, or soon enough bye bye everybody